I was explaining to them is like I can't really feel my glutes, but Mark and Seema feel them all the time. What was yeah. that brown brown thumb technology <laughs> you're talking about? <laughs> yes, please explain that because that shit sounds real scammy. And there's a lot of people who specialize in one thing. It's hard to put me in a box. I don't. I have a problem with authority and uh, systems, and so like I like it all. But a good coach is somebody who can bring awareness to the client, to the athlete, or to the patient. Right. So when we can say. You know, can we get Andrew to feel this? Mm. Once he feels it, this is this is the money spot. If we, if, otherwise, he's just doing what we tell him. We get no feedback of what he feels, and he doesn't even understand what's happening. What are certain things that a majority of people listening can be doing each day that can put them ahead, so that when they, if something does happen, right? Well, you're already walking, you're not sitting around, etc. Like, what are just the things that they can start doing that are simple right now? Does change happen without trauma? I think about all the people who, man, they tried to lose weight, they tried to lose weight, and then boom, something happened. I wanna like look them in the eyes and say, what happened to you? What was it that caused you guys to practice and try all these different things within the field? When I get questions from students or chiropractic students, especially or PT students or something, and they ask for advice, I, I always say, choose your mentor very wisely. In your guys' practice, because we were just talking about traumas and stuff, do you guys explore like the mental side of things? Lay on the floor for at least 10 minutes a day. I don't care what you do down there. Doesn't matter. Play, explore, do whatever. Reverse cowgirl. It's all fine. Hey, <laughs> now. Speaking my language. Let, let's, we've been pretty abstract today. Let's be specific. Can you, do, can you move your toes? Can you lift up just your big toe? Work on that. Can you get a lacrosse ball and put it on the bottom of your foot? Can you walk around barefoot for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you will notice measurable changes, if you can do that with the minimum amount of consistency in your life. Can you guys just tell Andrew, we've been trying to tell him, can you just have him deadlift again for us? <laughs> and Sam and I, we just want him to deadlift. You, don't bring me into this. I never said that. All right. <laughs> You want to you need deadlift. to deadlift again, doctor's orders. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's this famous track coach. He's a, he says, there's a difference between pain and pain pain. And I think we kind of know the difference between yeah. the two. The and way. after years of doing chiropractic, um, how do you guys feel about it? The people that lived the longest, the activity that they did was it was by far racket sports. It's it's a variable movement, you know, the ball's going. It's rare all to see over. a fat guy with a tennis racket. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> that image though popped up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to like think about it. And you're like, no, I don't think I can come up with any. Power Project family, how's it going? This episode is brought to you by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. Now, we've been wearing Vivos for almost a year now, but the great thing about Vivos, unlike normal shoes, where you put your foot into these casts that aren't mobile, they have a small toe box, and they're, they're very dense, is that you're putting your foot into a cast. You're weakening your feet. You don't feel the ground in normal shoes. The great thing about Vivos is they're extremely flexible. They have a wide toe box. They are made to help strengthen your feet. One thing I want to mention here is that when you grab some Vivos, you may tell yourself, these are uncomfortable or these hurt. That's because your feet are weak. And as you wear these shoes, they'll start to get stronger. They'll start to feel the ground. They're good for the health of your feet. Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. So me personally, I, it took me about two weeks to really be able to be like, okay, I think I'm getting it. Now I do not wear any other type of shoes. I only wear Vivo barefoot shoes. You guys have to do this for your feet. Head over to VivoBarefoot.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Again, VivoBarefoot.com. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. You guys watched House? Sure. Well, that was my favorite show. So that was House. one of my favorite shows as a kid. House. Yeah. The, yeah, you know that show, yeah. The yeah, Doctor, yeah. Doctor House. Yeah. He's like this. Uh, Everything is lupus. Ex e <laughs> <laughs> is that what yeah. it was? In the show, that was that was like the saying. Mm. Like, Everything is lupus because they always had to rule that out in every case. What's what? that? An autoimmune disorder? Mm -hmm. Everything's an autoimmune disorder, right? Yeah. What was yes. the what's the deer tick one? Um, Lyme, oh, disease. Lyme disease. Yeah. Everything is lupus or Lyme disease mm. in house. Hundred <laughs> percent. Man, That's what? interesting. You get bit by a tick and then you have a disease. Isn't that weird? That's pretty wacky. Mm. We're so soft. What happened? Mm. What are you doing? Oh, here we go. Collagen oh. protein. <laughs> <laughs> He's making up these mixtures on here all the time. Nah. We got a chemist on the show today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did have one before. <laughs> yeah. The gorilla yeah. chemist. Gorilla chemist. Yeah. yeah. That was a good episode. You guys should go check that out. But this one's better, so stay Have here. you guys ever tried some mind bullet? <laughs> uh -oh. No. Yeah, we have some mind bullet. I don't know if doctors do mind bullet. but They'll do it. Drink it. Just drink it. I'll don't ask questions. I don't do. Drink the whole. Drink it. Do I don't you guys even... have a chaser? It doesn't. You don't uh, chaser. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I got a... I'm gonna take some. 
You won't. Oh, I'll do it. Want to yeah. hit these mind bullets? I did capsules earlier, so I'm good. You did capsules. That's what like sounds like my dad talking about like marijuana. He's like, did you do grass today? Yeah. Did, did you did grass? you have a marijuana you're, cigarette? You're, did you do pot? Yeah. <laughs> I did marijuana a smoke cigarette? Pot. Smoke pot, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Down the hatch. Woo! How's there it taste? Go. Tastes like it's doing something. And <laughs> how's your back? Did these guys do anything or are they worthless? So... What's the uh, verdict? Well, we'll see. I guess verdict's still out. But no, no, it's been like, what, half an hour, 20 minutes? I know, I'm curious. You should know by now. <laughs> My left glute is already twitching, which I expected to happen. And Seam and I have had that happen to you as well. Yeah. We've done that for you. <laughs> Thank you So very like much. I was I was explaining to them is like I can't really feel my glutes, but Mark and Seema feel them all the time. Sure. But they get mad at me when I can't activate them. Mm-hmm. Within, I don't know, <laughs> a couple seconds, you guys had my glutes firing pretty good. Wow. And that was kind of amazing. Yeah. Cause like I've tried many things and, you know, um, outside of biomechanics, I haven't really been able to get anything to really activate them. But once I, you know, can figure out how to turn them on, it seems like they, they either my back takes over and it doesn't want that to happen anymore. Mm-hmm. And it does whatever the heck it takes to turn out, turn them off. And so, um, I mean, you guys can explain everything that was going on, but like my glutes and my, my groin, uh, wow. there's a lot of stuff going on in there that has, <laughs> I, I was touched in places I've never been touched before. Put it that hey, way. We got that holy hip trifecta, hamstrings, adductors, and glutes all yeah. together, bro. What was yeah. that brown, brown thumb technology <laughs> you're talking about? <laughs> yes. Please explain that. Cause that shit sounds real scammy. And how do I, uh, how do I get real disagree. just rapey? I don't disagree. <laughs> Can I'm I get, being real. Can I get certified in brown thumbing or is, do you have to go to school? Imagine uh, getting an image of somebody's face like when they're hearing like they got their face down on the chiropractic table. <laughs> All right. And then like, oh, have you ever heard of the brown thumb? You're like, what in the hell's going on back there? <laughs> there are consent forms for this. <laughs> there are. Yeah. No, yeah, no tell no, it. Yo. There's the, I mean, there's a school. It's called Logan Chiropractic College. Where is Logan? Do you remember? Is this St. Louis? St. Louis. Or Kansas it, City? It's still a school. Like there are people there now. It's a place of education. And they... <laughs> Do coccyx, ad- internal coccyx adjustments. So the bottom of your sacrum ends in the coccyx, which can be accessed internally through the sphincter. Mm-hmm. Oh. You don't have to make it weird. You just stick your thumb in there. Oh, I apologize. Thank I apologize. God. I'm sorry. <laughs> Normalize the brown thumb. You know. Mm. Wait. So actually, please do explain this. So mm. a doctor <laughs> yep. will stick whatever they use. They'll stick their thumb. Yep. <laughs> and how thumb. do they massage? Like, what do they do? Is it base towards the the you know like what, what goes on yeah so i mean they believe and i'll say it that way that y- the alignment of your spine is based off of your sacrum so the spine ends in the sacrum yeah. this upside down triangle and the ba- the tip of that can be accessed through the sphincter and so if they can manipulate that they'll assess and they'll say you're there's a torsion to the left to the right you got no choice you've got <laughs> <laughs> And if they can get in there and manipulate it back into place, uh-huh. we can align you properly. I guarantee that like 98% of these doctors are men and 95% of their clients are women. <laughs> I just picture like <laughs> them snapping the glove on, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. I'm all excited. I'm, I want to give them a little street cred. Here we go. If, if you fall and you maybe displace that end of your tailbone, the mm-hmm. coccyx, there's really only one way to, to move it. Like, mm. uh, you don't want to go through like massive internal okay. surgery to move mm. this bone. So if you have somebody who's willing and maybe skilled, I'm super not sure that a super friend, a super, a, a very super very super friend. friend. Yeah, yes. I mean, you can see these on uh, imaging, like X-rays. You'll see that uh-huh. it's just completely twisted because they maybe fell hard on a snowboard accident or something. Yeah. There's there's not always a lot of ways to move that guy back. Now. I, I didn't go into that club in school, the, the fix the, the coccyx bone club, but I'm glad somebody does it. Mm. Just, Anybody from the land in school, I do apologize because we're just making jokes. Like what you do is respected and we thank you for and it. And we're gross. And we're just <laughs> gross children. At least we are. Yeah. You two are professionals. That's true. Eh. I appreciate you saying that. It's yes. not true, but <laughs> Logan Chiropractic is a place. Logan. And I'm sure it's a wonderful institution with some wonderful people, but that's what it is. Brown Thumb. Mm. It would would yeah. that be? Uh, I've heard of um, Bowen therapy. Is that the same thing, or is that something totally different? No, that's bra- like that's like breathing. <laughs> really? Okay, so well, that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, I'll have that's to like look it up. Maybe and I'm breathing. getting them wrong. No, because I so I had seen somebody, and they said there was like I thought it was called Bowen therapy. You could be right, I don't and know. maybe I'm wrong. So oh, well, here's the thing, and here's <laughs> where I was like, this is bullshit, <laughs> because uh, he worked on my wife, and was just like, oh, did you have you know a, a lower back? accident or something where like something with your coccyx coccyx like was 
hurt or whatever. You come in, you're like, hold up. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> excuse me. I know, right? Because then yeah. it's like, oh, I'm going to get in there. But, um, and so during her first pregnancy, she broke her tailbone. He's like, oh, that's what it is. But then when he saw me for a totally different thing, he's just like, hmm, you have a lower coccyx injury, don't you? And I'm like, I don't think so. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, I'm pretty sure. But he said the exact same thing for a different <laughs> like, fucking thing. Are you sure you don't? <laughs> yeah. As like in, the, the Jedi mind. I character. don't know yeah. if I do. Do you need a check? Yeah. <laughs> this is so weird. I'm remembering all this right now, but he didn't put on a glove. He put like, <laughs> it was yeah, like a dental that, dam. Yeah. <laughs> he just covered my like lower, like back slash upper butt cheeks. And then he got his finger like in my crack. I can't believe I just remembered all this right now. Sorry, wow, guys. so you it's literally, like, you pinned that away. Yeah. As you were traumatized. Oh repressed memory. Yeah. And, then, and then when you leave the office, he's like, how's your back? You're like, what? <laughs> he's like, my job here is done. <laughs> he wakes up. He's like, do you need, do you need a cigarette? Uh, <laughs> As he's smoking. But yeah. Damn. My bad. But yeah, sorry. Oh. Just remembered that all right now. Yeah. You can back. do some stuff through the prostate too, right? Like, who do we have on the show who's like laying down on the bathroom floor with something up? His ben Greenfield. Ben, ben Greenfield. Greenfield. There you yeah. go. Yeah. He would. Like, there yeah. could be some awesome. tension relief in there, maybe. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah. Right? Milking the prostate. That's a thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Tom Segura and his butt plugs. I mean, uh, yeah. It's like not, not uncommon. <laughs> there might be something to it or not really. There's, there's definitely something game. to it. There's definitely something to it. I, I don't have an adequate explanation. Mm. Bobby? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have any personal <laughs> experiential evidence here. So I will back well, no, no judgment of us have a butt plug in right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we feel great. <laughs> What's amazing is like we all control each other's like vibrations and stuff. Yeah, we yeah. have the remote in our pocket. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't know till after fun. the show who we have. I so think, it's, it's a fun yeah. game. I think I have Andrews, but I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll <Okay>. <laughs> see. <laughs> but before, okay. <laughs> learning <we're>, super friends. <laughs> we we're going to get into. everybody, by the way. <laughs> no, we didn't lose them. They're still here. And we're going to get into some really good stuff. But uh, not to joke. And this is no jokes. Like I, uh, me and my girl, we got some butt plugs. I haven't used it yet, but I plan to because mm. there's some spots up there, you know? Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing weird about it. So all you gentlemen in the audience that are like, hmm, oh, this is gay butt plugs, give it a shot, maybe. You might just learn some different levels of pleasure that you never knew before. Mm -hmm. Like I'm about to. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to like it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you like a dick in the butt. It just means that <laughs> you like a little something, you know, Did tickling you, around. It you may there. also. It may also mean that. <laughs> <It's okay>. Maybe we <laughs> 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 Maybe we <laughs> I'm being real though. Anyway, yeah. let's get to the topic at hand. Let's stop the immaturity. What were we talking about? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> Brown thumbs. Uh, Brown well, thumbs. There you go. But yeah, it started with like the glute activation that yeah, I got. Yeah, you guys are fixing there up. Uh, there it is. Andrew's back. How'd you guys? How'd you guys meet? How'd you guys get together in the first place? Yeah, John and I went. We had the same um, employers. We were both working together in Texas, and uh, yeah, I moved down there. I'm not from there, but that's where I met him. And I moved away and went to Europe for a few years. And a couple of years after I was gone, we just always had conversations. We just never stopped talking clinically, whether it was texting or calls. And, and uh, one day it was just like, why don't, why don't we record some of this? May, we don't know who it's going to be for, maybe just some friends or some other colleagues. But uh, yeah, that's, that, it all started from that, us working together. But we were just colleagues working at the same mm -hmm. location. In the beginning. Helping people with like physical therapy type stuff. Is that the yeah, education background for both of you? We're both chiropractors, um, mostly manual therapy and rehab. So, I mean, it looks a lot more like physical therapy, honestly, uh, but we just combine a bunch of different techniques together. Um, and there's a lot of people who specialize in one thing. It's hard to put me in a box. I don't, I have a problem with authority and uh, systems. And so like, I like it all. Uh, we, so we bring things together, but then we talk about hard cases. So we'd be like, we just need to record this. We need to give this because then we tell other people, they're like, what were you guys talking about? And we're like, well, maybe we should put this down and give this to somebody else. Um, so yeah, and it went from there. So actually, I want to ask you guys about this because when people think of chiropractors and they've been mm. paying a lot of attention to a lot of different types of content, most people, not most people, but a lot of people are starting to believe that chiropractors in the classical sense are bullshit. The individual that you go into and they're like, let me snap your shit up for you. Mm -hmm. You hear some knocks here and there and you're like, ooh, I feel better. Yeah. Um, what are your opinions on that? Do you believe that does things? And that's not necessarily all you do, correct? For sure. Yeah. You want to go on that one? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've used this analogy many times with John, like I, I've always said, I felt like I'm selling furniture in an Apple store. Like as, a, cause I have a chiropractor as a label on yeah. myself and yeah. people have expectations when they come in the room, exactly what I'm going to do. So it's like, they come in to an Apple store and I'm trying to say, well, you already got a decent iPhone. It's not really your problem. You don't have anywhere to sit. 
Like mm-hmm. you need some fur, you need a bed to lay on. And they're like, mm-hmm. well, that's great. I just, I just want the iPhone. Can you just give me the <laughs> iPhone? And this is the equivalent to like, I can see you need to rehab this or you need some load in these tissues or whatever. And they say, yeah, but can you just crack me? Like that's at the end, you know, that's, that's the kind of expectation that you get with chiropractic and that's all fine. But that's um, like when I lived in Europe, it was pretty much like you know, like there's no there's eighty thousand. I last I checked, like eighty thousand chiropractors in the United States, okay. and they're very variable. Some are very high volume; they only adjust, and other times they're they don't adjust at all, and they're all into rehab. But in like where I was living, they're all pretty much the same. It's they're just t- the typical chiropractor that you think of. So that it really felt like, like I said, f- selling furniture in an Apple store. So I felt mm-hmm. like every patient I had to sell them. And they're like, why is this different than physio- physiotherapy? Why is this different than physical therapy? And so that, that is, you know, uh, a tough position to be in sometimes where you always have to feel like you have to sell from that position. But chiropractic in the United States is, is quite vast. So when people say, it's like when I lived in Europe and people say, I didn't like the United States. I say, where did you go? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, New York City. Well, that just means you didn't like New York City. So chiropractic's the same way. There's so many of them there. You just, you know, if you don't like one, it just maybe don't go find the, the same office of another chiropractor with a, like some, you know, franchise, yeah. try something different. And those, those guys can be, or girls can be totally different. Yeah. yeah. I'll bring it back to like Andrew. So we were like, one of the problems with his back and he has many problems was, is an instability. So most chiropractors are snapping necks and cash checks. God bless. It's fine. It's one way of treatment. But if you're going to adjust somebody with an instability, you're going to make that instability worse. And so we learn how to evaluate. The first two years of chiropractic school are exactly like medical school where they go off and learn pharmacology and toxicology. We'd go more into orthopedics and biomechanics and rehab. We go the other way. Um, So like going through evaluations and learning these adjustments when you you're like, this guy's immobile. Why would I make him more mobile? Why would I go that way where he needs more stability, mm. more hip movement? And it just becomes more specific. You just, as a professional, you get better and you get more specific at what you do. So you just can help people better. And so the traditional chiropractic route of manipulating and getting people more loose and mobile, which is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, but people with an instability don't need more stretching. It makes them worse. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, so you kind of learn that early in your career or you don't learn that in your early in your career and you hurt people or you find that out and you're like, maybe I should fix something in myself. Maybe there's something else to this profession. It's just a doctor of the outside of the body, a, a doctor of your meat suit and doctor of your mm-hmm. movement. Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, people like um, Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy, I think one of the things that he's done really well and same with Kelly Sturette is they've shown people Hey, you know what? It's okay to move and it's okay to experiment. Okay, I heard what you said. Your knee hurts, but uh, can we train your calves? Can we train your shin? Can we train around the knee? Um, can we see if you can get into a lunge type position? Can we? And if he can't, then he has uh, regressions, right? He's got all these different movements and Sturette, uh, same thing, and would say, hey, maybe you know, be, maybe your knee is locked up, and you might want to roll on this foam roller. Uh, maybe you want a super friend to, to mash on particular areas to help free up that area. And I really just like the idea of uh, <clears throat> let's put the title of doctor kind of into the average person's hands for just a little bit because when someone comes to see you guys and they have a sprained ankle or they have certain conditions, you guys are going to do an evaluation of them, but it's an evaluation of them that they never really thought of for themselves. And I think you certainly could – even without the vast knowledge that you guys have, you can probably say, oh, I wonder, you know, my ankle got twisted pretty bad. I wonder how it is being on one foot. Uh, I wonder, you know, when I push off on that calf, how it feels. And you can experiment a little bit. So I literally like the idea of like, uh, let's have people kind of play with and, and examine themselves a little bit. Um, and maybe uh, when people go to you guys, it doesn't have to always end up being this like last resort thing. Mm. And then you guys are expected to like fix something. It could be like, hey, I actually looked at this myself and I tried a bunch of stuff and it didn't seem to work really well. So now I'm here because I want to get more stability to that area, more mobility to that area. Yeah, that happens a lot because people are self-researching like crazy. I mean, that's what is happening on the other side of these microphones right now, I think. Like people are hungry and want to learn and there's a lot of information out there so especially when people come in these days they're way more educated than you know they even 10 years ago when we first started treating uh 
people know who Kelly Starrett is and people come in and already know who Ben Patrick is. And so as a doctor, you also need to know that um, and then be able to work within that frame and move them where they need to go, basically, yeah. Because they might have a misunderstanding also, right? Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. And I think a, you know, a good clinician, their job is to make people aware of their situation. Like, you know this because you've trained in SEMA, Mark, like you've trained lots of athletes and you know the one where you're trying to show them something quite remedial, right? Like, I don't know, Bul Bulgarian split squat. And it just looks awful. And you're like, can't, no, no, just put your foot here. And they, mm -hmm. it just seems like they can't do it, right? But a good coach is somebody who can bring awareness to the client, to the athlete or to the patient, right? So when we can say, you know, can we get Andrew to feel this? Mm -hmm. Once he feels it, this is, this is the money spot. If we, if, otherwise, he's just doing what we tell him. We get no feedback of what he feels, and he doesn't even understand what's happening. Right? Just like if you just tell the person, oh, they did a bad squat, or your squat looks good, they don't know why, and mm -hmm. they can't feel it. Right? So a, a good coach, a good clinician, gives awareness to the, to the person so that they know what to look for, what to feel, how to know that they're improving, et cetera. And, right? and, and not everybody's the same. I can show in SEMA, and he's starting to pick up on the stuff right away, and somebody else who doesn't have any of that experience, it's a, a very difficult task. Andrew did good. He did well. He did a well. 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 good job. He did well. well thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask this because there's a, there's a bunch of things I'm, we're curious about. But for an individual who's like sitting most of the time, let's say that they come into you with a bunch of issues. Um, one of the things that we try to figure out are like big lifestyle habits that can make some of the biggest changes. Because we know that like if you're not, if you never walk, right? there's gonna be a lot of dysfunctions that happen there. If you sit in an office desk and then you get up and you go sit at home, there's gonna be a bunch of problems that happen there. So if you can simply get up and start moving, you'll probably get out of certain issues. But what are certain things that a majority of people listening can be doing each day that can put them ahead so that when they, if something does happen, right? Well, you're already walking, you're not sitting around, et cetera. Like what are just the things that they can start doing that are simple right now? Yeah, I mean, this is a million dollar question, right? Yeah. But I mean, the, the, the biology term for this sometimes is called evolutionary mismatch, mm -hmm. where we, the mismatch is what we are kind of evolved or designed based on your belief system to do yeah. compared to what we typically do every day. That mismatch and that breadth of the gap tends to be commensurate with <laughs> the level of issues that a person is exposed to, right? So... Yeah, like sitting 10 hours a day in a nice sofa and, and looking at a, an LCD screen from with, backrest. with myopia, which is like, you know, it's three inches from your face and you mm -hmm. never look far anymore and you're wondering why your, your far vision is going away mm -hmm. right? and you're wondering why your hips don't move and your back is starting to hurt and you can't rotate it and a golf kind of hurts when you swing. It's like it's because you have a mismatch from what your body has kind of been doing for thousands of years and what we do now. And, and that's why there's a whole group of people like Move Nat and as we could keep going and listing these people that mm -hmm. believe like, let's just move how we were supposed to move. That's easy to say. Yeah, It's hard in practice though, at least in my experience. You can't just tell somebody, hey, you need to appreciate bare feet and walking on rocks and you also need to appreciate meditation. And there's like 90 things that we can give them. Appreciate the taste of the liver. Appreciate the taste of liver. Steak shake is good. Like by there's the way. tough things. Mm, that steak shake is delicious, oh, awesome. dude. It is pretty. Good. It is yeah. so good. Just Thank add you some. Guys. Yeah. And if you don't like all that stuff, you don't notice that it's in there. I do happen to like organs and stuff, but I couldn't taste it in there. Bobby's weird, but the, I mean, the answer to your question is: the answer is you're going to need to do something that you will continue to do. Mm -hmm. So okay, so you got ten thousand steps today. Will you continue to do it? Can you? So a lot of people have ideas of jumping into barefoot shoes which is yeah. fantastic sometimes they jump off of a cliff and their feet are just wrecked mm -hmm. and so they'll get barefoot shoes i love vivo barefoot right wonderful stuff yeah um what's the discount code uh power project save 20 percent off oh interesting um <laughs> but but sometimes they jump off a cliff and get those beautiful vivo shoes for 20% off, mm -hmm. and then their feet are wrecked and they never do it again. They, they're like, Vivo shoes are trash, barefoot stuff is garbage, it's yeah. useless. And so you need to give an appropriate thing where they're gonna do it a lot. Like, honestly, when you guys were doing your 10,000 steps challenge, like, that's it. Start there. 
drink water. Like none, of, I think most people know what they need to do mm -hmm. to be totally honest with you. I think, you know, you need to eat like an adult. I think, you know, you need to get off the couch. I think, you know, you need to spend less time on your phone. I think you need to wind down before bed. And, you know, I think people know these things, like the information's out there. I think it, I don't know, maybe it's some more of an internal motivation. Like we were talking about this as well. Like what makes people change? Um, and Usually, I wanted to ask you, yeah. I wanted to say like in your experience, like getting through to the people that are hard to get through to, like, what have you found that, that, that helps? And do you fail most of the time? Uh, how does it look? Uh, I'm just trying to manage myself, you know, trying yeah. to get myself to make changes and that's yeah. difficult in and of itself. Like mm -hmm. that's a big hurdle to, ta to figure out. Unfortunately, I think most of these things, they, they start off, uh, in a direction that like doesn't always make sense to somebody. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's like, man, I'm really having a hard time with my diet, then I usually want to talk to them about like their sleep and some of their other habits. And they're like, no, I have a problem with the food, mm -hmm. but you have a problem with the food because you're tired, you're mm -hmm. fatigued. You're not getting your phone out of your room. You know, it's all this stuff that sounds foofy and sounds kind of stupid. And you're like, fuck that. I got plenty of friends that are in great shape and they have, and they're on their phones all night and they don't sleep. But the hard thing is, is like, that's not you. Yeah. And so it's very difficult to like truly understand, say, you know what? You're right. I'm glad you pointed that out to me. I need to do this. And it, I think maybe eventually you stumble upon it yourself and you're at work or something one day and you're just overwhelmingly tired and you're like, it's in my best interest to make the change. My friends were right. The podcast I listened to, that was correct. And so I think it takes, you know, when it, when you get advertised to, like it's, I don't know, seven times or something that you're supposed to hear something yeah. um, within one advertisement. And then you're supposed to hear the thing three times after that. So that's over 20 times. So maybe you need to be presented this information over and over and oh. over again. I don't know if you guys found that to happen with yourselves, but that's happened for me. Um you just kind of keep, you're like, keep hearing that, man, I keep hearing about kettlebells and, mm. and I, and you use them for a little while. And then you're like, these suck. I kind of threw out my back with it or whatever happened. And then you use them again for a little bit and then you dismiss them. And then somebody else says it again. And you're like, fuck that, man. I really do need to actually do that. So it just takes a really long time. I think it's a very hard part of it. Have you ever heard of uh, the phrase sympathetic magic? No, I have not. Okay, so sympathetic magic basically means you copy somebody until you can do it yourself. So like I just see and see a rolling uh, and, and basically you try to mimic them. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, when we were kids, I was like, I want to play basketball like Michael Jordan, you know, like, and if I watch enough of him, I can learn how to square up my shoulders and say goodbye to the ball. I'm never going to be Jordan, but to an extent copying somebody, I think in, until you see somebody out there that you're like, I kind of, I want to look like Mark. I want to move like Enzima. I, I want to be able to sleep like John, uh, whatever it is. Um, I think that you can start copying people. You know what I mean? And I think until they see a model worth copying, and this is, then it turns it back on you because you have to be that model. You are making an impression on people. And if your impression is, is dog shit, if you are not holding yourself up to your own standards, then why would people get into your barefoot shoes? Why would they swing a kettlebell? You know what I mean? So I think if you can provide that example for somebody and they're just like, ah, you have to make that thing attractive enough so that they want to do it. I think as a doctor, as a chiropractor, because there's plenty of doctors and chiropractors out there who are slobs. <laughs> Some of them are my friends. A lot of them, unfortunately. Um, now they're good people. But <laughs> but I mean, like you, you can't tell someone to do 10,000 steps if you are not doing 10,000 steps. Mm -hmm. You can't some, tell someone to go sit in a sauna if you don't sit in a sauna. And I think once you have that experience in yourself and you can relate that to someone else and they go, Phew, I feel like that might benefit me. Like I can relate to that person. That sympathetic magic starts to transfer. That's what they say. And then you're like, okay, I can do it. Let's sit in a sauna. Let's drink water. Let's go for 10,000 steps. I um, think you get that when you uh, continually try to push uh, a lot of options forward. You know, more mm, recently I copied I like that. something that I saw Jason Klepa do with a kettlebell yeah. and I'm like, I'm just going to do that for a couple of weeks, you know, and I'm on like week three of it. And I just try to do it like uh, 
just a handful of times a week, and it's something that's fun and easy to do. But why not mimic Jason Kalipa? Like he looks great. Yeah. He's a savage in every every sense of the word. Yeah. And so why not kind of mimic some of what he's doing? Mm -hmm. But in some of the messages that we have with some stuff like fasting and stuff like that, I think sometimes they'll see the shape that he's in or the shape that I got myself into, mm -hmm. and they'll say these guys don't have the same problems that I have. Mm. But if you ever seen this guy eat, I mean, it's got to be a burden to walk around with that amount of hunger in your body. But, but does he put it away? I don't, I don't know how he eats. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. 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 He could eat a lot. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for myself too, I'm always hungry. I feel like there's constant temptations around all the time with different snacks and different food. And I don't think maybe people don't understand the internal battle I have all day, every day mm -hmm. with how much I actually love food. Yeah. And I don't really have a lot of other things that I feel I'm doing that are super negative to myself. Like I don't really love drinking. I don't necessarily like love drugs and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I, it's like, this is like the one thing that I really enjoy. Yeah. I love it. And I want to like- <laughs> Some eat, good food out there. Yeah, I want to eat all the yummy stuff that we always talk about and get <laughs> sidetracked with on this, uh, on this show. Yeah. But fasting, which sounds counterintuitive, has been really helpful. Because it's just taught me to be more patient. You're not going to die if you don't eat that food right now. <laughs> you know, you're going to be fine. Yeah. And I've done like five day fast and done a bunch of different things just yeah. to try to explore that. So I think whatever the thing is that someone's dealing with, if they can kind of think almost maybe not all the way the opposite on everything, but if you can kind of think the opposite or think of what your life could look like if you uh, built up a tolerance towards that thing that's always. Uh, kind of bugging you, then you can build up some resilience towards that and you should be able to kind of fight through it every day to the point where it's no longer a fight. It's just like, I don't eat until two o'clock. Right, right, right. Does change happen without trauma? Because I, I feel like, Bobby, you were talking about, what was what was that study you were talking about? Or the, the Harvard guy? Change happens without trauma, I think, for people that, are, uh, that have experience prior yeah. With probably a trauma. So mm -hmm. based off of previous history, like I don't want to fucking go through that again. Right. And then so you can you can figure it out from like there. a controlled trauma. Like out there in the gym, you put a couple racks on your back, that's trauma to your body in, in a controlled sense. Mm -hmm. Like control, self inflicted, yeah. Con, if, yeah. If you don't do it yourself, it's gonna happen to you nonetheless. But sorry, what was the Yeah, I, I think I think I could get this wrong, but I think this was Tim Billu. The, you know, one of the guys that, mm -hmm. Tom Billy, sorry, Tom, yeah. that, that helped start Quest and everything. I think he was interviewing somebody who was like uh, one of the most renowned psychologists from Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, or he was at least witnessing this conversation where he, they asked like, hey, can people change? And this is the guy that's been studying change his whole career. And the guy said, after the age of 25, not really. And then, so Tom, so Tom goes, what are you telling me? Everything I do is like a waste of time. Like, <laughs> yeah. should I just shut down impact theory? Is it all, is it all over or what you guys do? And he said, Un unless there's trauma. And, and I kind of agree with that. I was, I, in a, in a sense, because I, I think about all the people who, man, they tried to lose weight, they tried to lose weight and then boom, something happened and they lost 80. And I, the first thing I want to talk to them about has nothing to do with how they lost their weight. I want to like look them in the eyes and say, what happened to you? Like what changed in your life that made, you, made it work this time? And mm -hmm. they almost always have a story. Like I got divorced. My mom died. You could say so, who hurt you to anybody and they'll just start crying. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> That's right. It, everybody. They'll say that too. Us, yeah. yeah. But it's the impetus sometimes for change. And I, I thought, well, that is kind of depressing that we have to go through trauma. So I thought... But I, I do think there's some hope for people that don't go through trauma, but they have to have some self-awareness. This mm -hmm. is like the self-inflicted trauma, whether it's just moving to a new location, you've never left your town that you're from, or going to swim and you're deathly afraid of water. I'm glad you cleared Doing that up. Doing hard things. Yeah. I'm glad you cleared that up because yeah. I think in each person's head, they're thinking of trauma being a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe one ter person's mm -hmm. thinking of a breakup, another person's thinking of uh, finding out a family member has a disease yeah. or having someone die. Like It doesn't always have to be those things. Correct. Mm -mm. It could be just that you got yourself uncomfortable with a, a new situation. I yeah, think a yeah. sauna could be trauma, honestly. Like, I mean, there are grades of, like uh, heat exposure. Get better, be more tolerant to stress and strain. Yeah. Yeah, but you just, it, it's also just self awareness. You know, this, how, how big is meditation in like the, 
the online space in the last 10 years? You know, mm-hmm. how much is people, they're telling you, CEOs and business owners, like, you need to meditate. Everybody told me to meditate for the last 10 years. And it's like, well, what do they get Fuck from you. meditation? I don't want to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what yeah. do you get from it? It's like, well, you might just finally stop scrolling or stop thinking whatever just pops into your consciousness at any moment and reflect for a second. And that can just maybe be enough to be a micro trauma for you to say, I should, I should actually probably go to the gym. We were talking more recently about um, being hyper-focused on self-improvement and personal development and how that rabbit hole can be something that like you're, you know, you're so overly obsessed with it that you're almost paralyzed because you're mm. kind of thinking of all these different things that you should be doing right. all the time. And then you get like a little bit of anxiety over mm. like, oh, I was supposed to do those kettlebell swings and I got the go to movements and I got the movements that I learned from Encima and I got the movements that I learned from these guys and that guy. And yeah. it's just like <laughs> after a while <laughs> can be kind of overwhelming. There's this, um, John Verveke is a cognitive science, uh, University of Toronto, tenured guy, brilliant uh, professor, was talking about what the definition of intelligence is. And he says, it's a general problem solver. And if you become too specific of a problem solver, you become blind to a lot of things. And so self-improvement, I mean, I love that train. Please self-improve. But like, if you neglect your wife, (laughs) your daughter, you know, like your job, like, so it becomes a general problem solver. And there are times I think you do need to focus absolutely on specific things. But the more intelligent people are actually more general problem solvers. And I was like, oh, it's absolutely true with, you know, in line with what you're saying. That kind of sounds like kind of what you guys were mentioning at the very beginning, like you and your hate of authority and not doing one thing. It seems that yeah. you guys got into being chiropractors, but what was it that caused you guys to practice and try all these different things within the field because i mean that's that's an amazing approach you're not just going with what this one person says and what this one person does you learn from all of these systems and you bring it into whatever the hell it is that you guys have now been able to create yeah when when i get questions from students or chiropractic students especially or pt students or something and they ask for advice i i always say choose your mentor very wisely because it's most likely going to dictate the way that you treat in the future so, for example, my first internship, I got really lucky and worked with a guy that pretty much only worked with the Minnesota Vikings and the Minnesota Wild and, the, and other NFL teams. Mm-hmm. That was my first internship. And he basically did nothing like traditional chiropractic. Yeah. It was two-hour visits, three hours sometimes. Uh, wow. all, with one person or with like with one person? Wow. Did you meet yeah. Randy Moss? Meet, <laughs> I, I cannot confirm or deny there we have patient on, health information. Um, HIPAA violations, mm-hmm. it's called. Uh, the board is always listening. I couldn't stop yeah. him on Madden, so I hate those guys. <laughs> <laughs> Little kids used to beat my ass on online Madden games. This is Randy Moss. Throwing bombs to Randy Moss. So. I love Randy Moss. There's always that one character that just... I always, thought, like, one play, I, right? I always thought if I saw him, I was going to punch him in the face. <laughs> but then I realized how big and athletic Randy Moss is and that he would kill me. He'd fuck it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mess you up. It's like, oh, shit, he's 6'4". Never mind. <laughs> Very fast. An NFL athlete. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, ahead, that, that, sorry, that sets you on the path because yeah. I mean that was the first time it opened up my eyes. Like, wait a minute, this is what the school tells you is just to pass your tests and to be, yeah. I, I, to be quite frank, like not a extreme danger to society. Their job is to make sure you don't hurt people and you'll most likely help them. Mm-hmm. But then it's really on you. I mean, your your education just starts when you leave the schooling, and then you start exploring and. You know, ignorance is bliss. Some people just never learn another thing from the day they graduate and they just, they feel like they are the genius in their field and that's fine. But it's, it's the Dunning-Kruger thing, right? The more you start studying, it's mm-hmm. like, oh my, I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know anything. Yeah. yeah. In, in your guys' practice, because we were just talking about traumas and stuff, do you guys explore like the mental side of things? Because like, you know, we were talking off air about like John Sarno's book that I'm getting into, mm-hmm. um, so I'm curious about that. I'm curious, does it ever get brought up like in school, like at all, as far as like the mental side of things that could be like harboring some of the chronic pain? And I've never read it, but also there's that book, The Body Keeps Score, that JL told you and me about. Yeah. I haven't read it. I Not need yet. to, but yeah. do you guys know about that? Mm-hmm. Uh, how, yeah, how applicable do you think this stuff is? It's very applicable, but not taught. So like Bobby said, I mean, they're basically making sure that we cover in school is making sure there's no red flags, there's no yellow flags. We're not, you know, really hurting people because people's bodies can be hurt. And so school is mostly like 
is this an orthopedic issue that you need imaging for or a higher level intervention? And chiropractors, our interventions are lower level than surgeries, thank God, mm -hmm. but people need them. But no, it's not covered. And I think mental health and awareness has become a lot bigger these days. Um, my boss, Jay Glazer, has a huge book. He's Every day he posts about his mental health. And so I'm glad that that conversation, we were talking about things that come around like barefoot shoes are back again from 2012. Yeah. One of the conversations that's up now, thank God, is mental health and awareness. But it's not taught. Um, I think it also becomes down to like the mental health and addressing it with a patient just kind of comes down to your personal skills with somebody. Like mm -hmm. people come to us all day in pain and you doctors want to inflict a treatment immediately on this person. And sometimes you got to look the person in the eye and each treatment has to be different. You have to apply it to the same person. And so just having enough awareness to like take a moment and listen to a person is not really taught to answer your question, mm -hmm. but wildly valuable. There, there's one other component to that. I agree with that, but also would be that our field or professionals are terrible at one thing, which is to say, I don't know the answer to this problem. Yeah. I'm going to send you to this person who's really good at that thing. Mm. So if somebody came into me and I could tell, I've had these patients, I can tell it's obviously an emotional thing or there's some kind of trauma in their life that they, they do not seem normal to me. And we have these things <coughs> called maling malingering tests which are tests that are designed to Faking basically it. say, uh, this means nothing, and but they're acting like it does mean something. So we kind of know, nah, this is probably. And, and there's other ways to tell besides just doing those tests, just just being aware and being in, being in contact with the, or being connected to the p person in front of you. And so like in my case, I would send them elsewhere. I would just send them to somebody I know who's very good at that, me personally. So I might delve into it if it's very a small, th maybe like you, you're a perfect example. I would not refer you away because I feel like you're not like a basket case. You're, you're trying. You, you mm -hmm. might have some mental component, well, but mm -hmm. it's still within the realm of what I would consider n normal recovery of, of a chronic issue that you've mm -hmm. been dealing with. <clears throat> yeah. There's something I do want to ask though about the John Sarnos thing, and mm -hmm. this is this isn't coming from a place of like I think it's bullshit. It's more so a devil's advocate type of thing because I've looked up some forums of people that talk about that book, and they echoed the same exact thing I heard Andrew say. It's like wow, it's like he knew how I grew up or it's like he knew what happened in my past relationships because Andrew, correct me if I go wrong anywhere, there's an aspect of like, you know, um, you lose, con like you, you don't have a strong of a relationship with your wife because you have a child and then oh, yeah, you, yeah, hold, yeah. And you hold certain pain in certain places and then it ends up stemming in your lower back and other mm -hmm. places. But I literally was reading comment after comment of people saying, Oh, it's like he knew my life, but it's like, if you take a very general idea of how most people live and then you stamp it on this and then you're like, well, you probably had this, this, and this, a few things are going to stick. And it makes me wonder how much of it is legitimate and how much of it is actually woo woo. Yeah. I'm curious. There is. So I 100% agree with you. You say 10 things, you know, a hundred people are going to be like, oh my God, that's me. But what I was telling in CMO, I'm like, dude, this chapter that I'm reading, I swear John went to the future, saw my life, and then went back and rewrote you know, everything about yeah. it. Because what he was saying, he's like, oh, it's usually um, a successfully driven person, somebody who has a hard time giving up or has a hard time leaving their job, uh, has a hard time feeling like they've done enough. And what Mark told you guys when I got in today was like, oh, I had to force him to take a vacation. Yeah. And you just, I'm like, oh fuck, he's talking directly <laughs> to me about yeah. me, you know? So there's things like that. And <clears throat> oh, oh yeah, and then the, the baby thing, you know, a new father, although, you know, I have a stepdaughter, but like the thing was, it's like, oh, a, a, a brand new father develops back pain after the baby comes because they're no, no longer the center of attention. They're no longer getting the uh, love and affection from their wife because they're, again, they're kind of on the back burner now, um, which was, it was just like was convenient, but like I already had the back pain before my son. But yeah, what Nsim was saying is true. Like that you see a lot of people talk about like, holy shit, that's exactly, he's describing me. And for me, he was like, it literally yeah. was me. And yeah, so, I think it's also a little bit easy to uh, pinpoint a person down if you're using a lot of positive. Mm. You know, think about if that framework was negative, you'd be like, that ain't me. Yeah. You know mm. what I mean? So if I'm like, you, you're a savage, you like to do everything 100% and, and you'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's me. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If it was written, uh, somebody who um, 
likes to be away from their family or would rather be at work than at home. Yeah. Like, no, that's not me. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. So positive lingo makes it a little easier to identify with, I think, mm-hmm. sometimes. Isn't this like the psychic tarot card kind of strategy, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Like in, I, I think you have an affinity or respect for people of, of color, black people. How did you know? Right? What? Like, like, right? what? Or, you he look knows like you. You do enjoy weight. <laughs> Well, you're <laughs> this guy knows his shit. But okay, so I'm not. I don't what think. Else do you see in the <laughs> I want to say this. I First don't think all. the John Sarno's thing is BS. But I like when I see some of those things, and then I, I'm reading about it. I'm seeing how people respond. I'm like, what is legitimate? And like, you know, you're curious. What part of this is legitimate, and what part of this is bullshit? Mm. If none of it might be bullshit, but what do you? What are you guys' thoughts on I, that? I think that um, a lot of times we live in a very scientific age, and if there's not research for it then is it real? Uh, okay. There's a thing back to this cognitive science. I'm just stealing all of this stuff. There's a thing called participatory knowing. Yeah. So like I, you can say that you can catch a ball and I go, okay, cool. But if I throw you a ball and you catch it, I'm like, okay, I can see that you can catch a ball. Yes. So if things relate in that sense, experientially, then I think it resonates a little bit more deeply, but we're very skeptic skeptical people if there's not science behind it are there three research studies that back it up otherwise i'm not touching that stuff and look I, i'm a doctor I, like we go by orthopedic tests and the research is great but you can't be controlled by that does mm-hmm. that make sense like absolutely so when something touches you on a deeper level like uh, hey the brown thumb we we're talking about <laughs> but w- when it resonates with someone on that level they want to i think a lot of people's instinct is to dismiss that because it's not scientifically backed up and so it that com- becomes woo woo but there are experiences and patterns in life that are just obvious it, yeah. it's pattern recognition it's really all there is it's larger scale pattern recognition yeah and i've spent my entire life up until like maybe even a year or so ago being that person that's like well where's the studies where's the proof yeah instead of googling the success success stories i'm going to google the people that have not had success and talk shit the most and listen to them more than anything and then just recently a a switch turned and i'm just like you know i'm going to believe everything and make sure like and just try it right i'm going to try it works doesn't work i'll find out but i'm not going to talk shit about it Mm -hmm. and guess what like my back's never felt better you know, like just by believing in this sort of thing, yeah. you know, having that mental side kind of click on where like I, I told you guys, like if I bend down and I, I think it's going to hurt, my back's going to hurt, it's going to hurt. Mm. If I prepare the way um, Stuart McGill teaches, it's probably going to hurt. If I just tell myself my back is strong and I'm not going to worry about it, mm. I'll be fine. Um, the hard part is going to be not telling my like having to tell myself that my back's strong and it's going to be fine it just have just having it be strong and not have to ever fucking even acknowledge it that's where i want to be sympathetic magic yeah well the thing is humans are are just extremely complex and way more complex than especially professionals are willing to admit sometimes you know like even the specialists when within our field sometimes they do a good job of telling you this like like uh, neurology you ask a, a neurologist how much we know about neurology, and they basically say, nothing. We don't know anything about it. But they can tell you 10,000 studies off the top of their head. Maybe they've even written books on the topic. But they're admitting that we don't really know these things. So it's hard to, to develop like a, a very good research study on something as basic as like a, like a ward study for nutrition. You know, Lane Norton talks about this, where it's really hard to get good studies done on even more simple topics we're talking about pain and emotion. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we're so mm-hmm. complex that to try to study this is, is very, very difficult. And so you have to take it with a grain of salt. What you can study is do the tenocytes, the little cells within the tendon, uh, replicate and grow? And do they become more if you do this exercise? That doesn't necessarily mean your pain will be gone or your performance will increase. So you have to kind of take research and make it simple enough that you can actually r- mm-hmm. do a study on it. But it's, it's not global enough to draw massive conclusions about things. So what works for you, you tell the next person, hey, just tell yourself, it's not gonna hurt when you bend over, just, or just, just uh, do this 50 kil- kilogram, uh, sorry, 110 pound <laughs> Jefferson curl, mm-hmm. and it'll be fine. And then they just blow their back out and they're, they're, <laughs> they're quadriplegic now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's each person's different. And that's also why it's extremely complicated. I think this is nutrition too, right? Like I do extremely well on low carb. So early on, I tell everybody to do low carb. Um, I don't do well on high fat. I just know 
anecdotally and experimentally, it's extremely high fats, not good for me. But another person can just eat salmon and lard and butter all day long, and they just they feel amazing and have no gastrointestinal issues. And this is the same with knee pain or hip pain. It's not like hip pain is caused by X or mm-hmm. his back pain is caused by Y. You know, it's caused by a a bunch of things that are enumerated much past the end of the alphabet, right? Mm-hmm. It probably just wouldn't hurt at all to uh, somebody that you're working with that's not, maybe they're, you know, three, four weeks down the road. They don't feel like they're getting uh, a lot, some of the results that they're looking for. I mean, it would only make sense to have them investigate something else. And maybe that something else would be to see a therapist from a mental perspective to help clear out any we've talked a little bit briefly uh, on our walk that we went on about like clutter you know people just mm-hmm. having like a lot of clutter in their life and how that could potentially be related to like some other things like i don't know if it is or isn't but from what i've seen when people improve their lifestyle and they when people improve small aspects of their lifestyle over a period of time everything seems to improve mm-hmm. so then they'll say the carnivore diet fixed my back because I know that because I had inflammation. Right. And like, who the hell knows? The inflammation word is like a weird one. Yeah. But you lost 30 pounds, and that is probably you know a, a big reason. But who knows what the real reason is why your back no longer hurts. It's probably uh, multifactorial. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, when you guys were working on me, um, you were uh, showing me or explaining to me how, like, how tight my hips are and how tight my quads are. And then as an example, you showed the same movements within SEMA, totally different. Um, but the one thing you guys told me, it was like, we can't compare you to somebody else, but we can compare your left side to your right side. Mm. Why is that so important? That's you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll come in. Yeah, because, well, there's a lot of reasons because you are definitely just you. You're the only you. And for, for various reasons, your history, your hobbies, your things that you've done, but also your anthropometry, the shape of your hips, the direction of the socket of your hips are, are different from the next person. Stuart McGill talks about this, you know, uh, years and years ago. So you have that. So what you can compare it to is the other side, because most likely the deviation from side to side is not enough for us to notice, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We would need some great instruments to kind of prove these differences. So when you see a hip on one side that rotates in beautifully and the other one can't, that's important because you, you, you were, unless you have some weird orthopedic issue that is very rare, you do not have two equal halves anymore or so to speak equal halves. And you should, you should have within a, a range of normality to be kind of equal side to side. And so when you have one side very different than the other side, we kind of know that you might have a lot of asymmetry side to side because your body has to compensate to that new position, right? If we put like a hoka on one side and barefoot on the other, it's not just the foot that's up compared to the other foot. The whole system now adapts to that. Like one pelvis hikes up and then you have a small scoliosis in the spine. You have to tip your head back to the other side just so that you balance the floor out. So side to side tells you unbelievable amount and it tells the patient a lot and we talk about this on our podcast about please have awareness like you don't have to know a name of a single muscle a joint nothing if you lay on the floor we did last month like a challenge just just lay on the lay on the floor for at least 10 minutes a day i don't care what you do down there doesn't matter play explore do whatever reverse cowgirl it's all fine hey (laughs) now speaking my language let's go (laughs) It, it, and what they'll do and, and gain awareness. In other words, they'll go, oh, my right hip is real. I can't sit in this like 90-90 position with my right hip. Mm-hmm. But if I flip the other way, it's no problem. Okay, now you might need a professional to help guide you where to go from there. But it, but the better awareness you have, you start to figure these, thing, these things out. I was, you know, and I was talking to Mark earlier. I said, I think professionals and chiropractors and PTs undervalue experiential uh, experience and, and anecdotal evidence, like somebody like Louis Simmons or Mark Bell, or you guys who just spent time in the trenches doing things, man, sometimes you can have a bigger impact than the person that can recite all these research articles. Cause, cause you, you've seen it, you felt it, you go through your own problems yourself and, and that, that count, that is kind of invaluable. Yeah. Comparing side to side, I mean, is basic orthopedics. I mean, uh, then comparing side to side, comparing above and below as well. James Syriax, the father of orthopedics, says you need to check the joints above and below. It's not crazy. It's uh, so. I mean, you're also this is there's a, a good amount of people who um, you're built asymmetrically. Like 
the right side of your body has an extra lobe in the lung and there's a liver that's a little bit heavier over there, right? On the left side, you have your heart and you have a smaller lung and then you have your intestines that go on. So most of us are a little bit heavier on our right side, mm. which predisposes us to a number of things. And these are things we have to take into account, right? And so that has a trickle down effect. The same way that a hokas in a barefoot would have a trickle down effect. When you take a big deep breath, your torso fills up in a different way and it predisposes you to certain twists. So if we only check the side that hurts, we're doing you a disservice, clinicians. <laughs> you know, you need to get an idea of the whole system. And the idea of the whole system also goes back to the, the mental side of things as well. There, there are orthopedic baselines. So you have to take all that into consideration, I think. And John, I want to ask you this because like mm -hmm. we were talking about feet earlier, but when we were talking about that in the gym, um, you're mentioning how some people make too big of a step too soon because this is like the second time where barefoot shoes and, and barefoot activities have like come into like become popular and they were, but a lot of people got themselves hurt. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us about like kind of how people got themselves hurt and then how people can safely transition? Because number one, Vivos aren't the only shoe out there. Right. There's a lot of other shoes that can be like ultras are pretty, mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, and a lot of other shoes that might help people in different ways. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people's feet uh, are incredibly weak. Yeah. And if you immediately expose them, it's the same thing with anything. Uh, you put a lot of weight on someone's back and they don't, they were not familiar with it. It's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So you can jump off the deep end and seriously like, make your foot problem worse. Like a lot of like the back pain we were talking about with the instability, a lot of people's feet have instabilities. Uh, you guys were talking about like piano toes, like moving your toes up and down, mm -hmm. like, and that connection, which most people can't do. Like if you're sitting at home right now, like try to lift up your big toe on the left, make it go, move the left pinky toe. Like a lot of times we just, I know you can do it. I see mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you can make it happen. <laughs> It's not easy. It's, it's not easy. And so there is this disconnect, which is a sign of weakness. And so if you have something that's weak and you go expose it to something like barefoot shoes, then you're going to expose that weakness and it's going to be worse. And this is why, where the goes back to your earlier question about how can people change and what do they need to do? Mm -hmm. I think long-term barefoot shoes are the answer, to be fully honest. Uh, barefoot sprinter guy. Like I think barefoot itself, if you can is a great way, a natural way, we're talking about kind of primal evolutionary stuff that your foot should operate. But on the way to there, mm -hmm. you need to be a little bit more specific. So if, you're, if you have foot pain, people ask me this all, I have pain, what should I do? And I'm like, I gotta evaluate. It, 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 I'm not a professional. I can't just crystal ball it like Sarno all the time. <laughs> uh, you have to get evaluated. So there mm -hmm. are shoes for overpronation, over supination. There's neutral shoes. Ultras are great shoes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think long term, barefoot's the answer. And you were also mentioning in the gym something about certain individuals who have like bone on bone stuff in their feet and just barefoot shoes aren't good for those people, correct? Correct. So what was that? So, I mean, that's the instabilities we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If those instabilities are there, uh, this goes to the body. We were talking about how to create extension. If those bones are on bones and you don't have the ability to use the muscles in your toes, yeah. the intrinsic muscles of your feet aren't working, then you're just going to collapse further into that bone on bone problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. So. I do want to mention too, because we've been talking about a Vivo and I'm using Vibrams too right now, but I've been wearing Vivos for about a year now. Mm. And as I was making that transition, I'm, I played soccer all my life, et cetera, but I had certain times where my feet were in fucking pain, <laughs> like mm. they hurt. So I want people to understand just like Mark, you're getting into running and it took you a while to get to where you are now, but yep. you had to make a gradual transition into being able to run three, four miles nonstop. Mm -hmm. This type of barefoot transition isn't just putting on a pair of Vivos and going out running. like you might have some pain sometime. You might have to go and wear some different, your normal shoes so that you can relieve your feet of some pain here and there. But it's not gonna be something quick. In the long run though, it can be, it's, I've found it to be extremely beneficial. Like I feel like a fucking kid because the connection now I can have to my feet, my toes and all that shit, it's exciting. Yeah. But give yourself time in that transition. And when you have these bumps in the road where you're feeling pain or like, if you start to feel pain in your knees because of something, just understand that it is a gradual transition. It's not going to happen in just a few months. It could take a few years, depending on where you started. The, the pay, people don't have that kind of patience, though. I mean, if you can be patient, 
it's so much better on the other end. If you're willing to be like, you know, six months from now, one year from now, what what sort of workout, what sort of food diet will do you want to have for, for to be good, feel good in a year? Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a wedding in six months, I get it. You have a quick thing you need to do, but like, what are you going to do for 10 years? What's your 10 year plan? And yeah. oh, ideally it's barefoot. Mm-hmm. Extend yeah. that time horizon. Fat Project Family, how's it going now? We like to look good in the gym and out of the gym. Uh, that's why you always see Mark and I and Andrew is stepping up on the short, short game, mm-hmm. wearing shorts from Viore and clothes from Viore. And honestly, the number one compliment that I've seen that I've gotten and even Mark's gotten is, damn, your butt looks good. <laughs> and that's because, well, the clothes we wear make our booties look mm-hmm. uh, delicious. Andrew, how can they get it? <laughs> yeah, you guys both have pretty big wagons. Uh, you guys can head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash power project to receive 20% off the most amazing apparel that looks so good inside and outside. It's going to make your ass look Fat and, and your people ass like will that. look fat. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Make your ass look fat. <laughs> I know Russia is not very popular right now, but we we often talk about the Russian versus the Bulgarian system of of Olympic weightlifting. Mm-hmm. Now I know there's the Olympic weightlifters out there. I know there's nuance to these programs. I'm talking about the general concepts. Yeah, we we tell people to be more like the Russian style. This idea that from the age of five to 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 their it's almost like their profession. Mm-hmm. They're spending ninety percent of their reps in sixty to seventy five percent of their one rep max. Do you know what I mean? Yes. They're just building reps. They're like laying the foundation. They're earning the right to do these things. Mm. And that's the same thing. You have to earn the right to, to just throw on Vibram, you know, five fingers and go for a 10 mile run. You have mm-hmm. to earn that right. As opposed to, you know, the Bulgarian system was this max out every day kind of thing. Uh, and then that works if you don't break, of course. But, but the idea was to be a little bit more like the Russians, this, this way of thinking like in the future, I, I, I'll be capable of great things. Because we know this. People will Google... Mark Bell's workout or Dmitry Klokov's workout yeah. or Milanachev's squat program. And it's and, and and what's the thing that we should say it back? It's like do what Milanachev did 25 years ago mm-hmm. or do what Klokov did when he was, you know, mimicking his father when he was 8 years old. Yeah. That's where we need to start. And people have terrible feet, let's be honest. Uh, mm-hmm. my feet aren't perfect. Some of the people in this industry that know more about feet than me have terrible feet. And they're just trying, you know, that's why they got so good at it is to trying to fix their own feet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, these things take time. It is water on rocks, so to speak, before we can smooth them out. And, and yeah, we have to, yeah, like the patience thing, I'm not good at it. I'm somebody that's learned from trauma. Mm-hmm. I had to hurt my back. I had to, to, to pull a muscle. I've had to kind of lose things I couldn't do before to where it kind of you know, knocks you out of this and says, hey, like, I don't want to keep going down this path. You know? And I want you guys to correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe it's because I'm so fucking excited about the Bertha thing, but you know, being an athlete for so long and me noticing personally how much of a change it's made for me athletically and the way mm-hmm. I move and different slightly naggling pains here and there, I, can, I, I, I feel like if I see this much of a difference and I've been doing the athletic thing for so long, I think it could be a massive mover for just anybody who just gets control of their feet and makes that transition over time that a lot of things, you know, you change this one thing and a lot of things just follow suit. Am I wrong in that logic or what do you guys think about that? I'm go ahead. Well, I was saying, remember when we were on our walk and we were talking about how we get guilty about maybe putting some cream or honey in our coffee. Right. Right. And it's like, that's somebody who's health conscious and we're still going, well, it's going to benefit us by maybe I just omit that sugar from my coffee. Mm. And, you know, Mark's kind of saying like, what about the people that have this all day long? This is all right. they do. Like what kind of benefits would they have if they pulled the sugar out? Mm-hmm. Do, you see, do you see what I mean? It's kind of, Same. it's this idea of like, of course it would have this immense no. impact, but they might have a longer process, yes. you know, to, to get where they want to go versus you. You'll get instant feedback a lot more. Your athleticism, you're constantly been a mover your whole life. This this has earned you rights that that the non mover or the old person much older than you mm-hmm. has got to to pay pay back to yeah. get those things. I think feet are a low hanging fruit. I mean, absolutely. There there are weak links in the body. There are patterns. Everybody is unique and specific. But I think the feet it's a foundation. 
Mm-hmm. It's your first contact with the ground. And if it, there's some sort of twist or torque or instability there, that starts to manifest itself upwards, right? Yeah. And so I think it's a really low hanging fruit that a lot of people can work on themselves. Do let, let's we've been pretty abstract today. Let's be specific. <clears throat> can you do, can you move your toes? Can you lift up just your big toe? Work on that. Can you get a lacrosse ball and put it on the bottom of your foot? Can you walk around barefoot for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you will notice measurable changes, if you can do that with the minimum amount of consistency in your life. And if things hurt, like if you put a lacrosse ball under your foot and Mm -hmm. it hurts a lot, that's probably a sign that your feet are not very strong and maybe not very resilient, right? Absolutely. And the same thing with like elbows and knees and stuff. If you get down on all fours and that shit hurts a lot, uh, you might have some issues with your tendons and ligaments and things of that nature, right? That's a that's where room to grow is. We can go back to our hips over here, right? When we did that exercise, we did an exercise where he was just activating his groin muscles. And we put him in a specific position. You could probably see that video on the YouTube channel. But I mean, he we spas it spasmed up pretty intensely. And the yeah. groin muscles not what you do what would you, what was your experience there? Well, yeah, I mean again, laying down on my side and I've never tried to quote activate my groin muscle that right, way. Right, at right, least right. I don't know if mm. like if you activate it when you're like thrusting forward during intercourse. Not sure if that's the same thing. But what I was doing was like pulling back. It was so weird because um, you had me do a couple different things, but then you put my knee in a certain position, uh, and again I'm laying on my side. And as soon as I lifted my knee up, I could feel everything just like nope. My body was yeah. like, dude, whatever you're doing, you need to stop right now because we've never done this and I don't know what's going to happen. I tensed up and it locked up. It didn't lock up. It just was about to cramp very fast. I mean, we're talking within like seconds of moving my my knee a certain direction. And so that and so that's when after that, Andrew wanting to get better over and over, he was like, what else can I do? And I'm like, <laughs> you have to work on this for a while. The, the weakness that you experience, the, the, the cramping that you experience is a sign of weakness that you're talking about, Mark, that you can work on. And mm-hmm. so like sit there, stay there, get better at that for a while. If, so if you experience weird pain in these interesting positions, and look, there's a difference between, there's this famous track coach, he's a, he says, there's a difference between pain and pain pain. And I think we kind of know the difference between yeah. the two. And so, yes, if you find those weak points, that's something to work on. Absolutely. Yeah, you find something that's just like ridiculously hurts, then that's probably not a great idea to push into that. Correct. But if it hurts a little bit and you can make progress there, that's you might it. be onto something. I think you said something in the gym earlier that I think was really useful. I'm like, how much pain is too much? And mm-hmm. you're like, well, if there's a regression, like if over the course of the next couple of days, you're like, ah, oh, like shit's getting worse. Well, then that's a pretty obvious thing is to kind of go based off. I mean, it'd be nice to just throw out a number to somebody, but it's kind of hard because everyone's uh, value of pain or degree of pain is different. I think you, you, I, because I respond, asked the question back to you and you said three. Yeah. And I think everybody's three is a different three. Right. But I think three is a healthy number. Again, pain or pain, pain that, yeah, absolutely. About a three, if you can love it. The, the orthopedic phrase is progressively worsening symptoms. Mm. That's when we, that's when flags go up as a doctor. Is it getting progressively worse? The same thing with running. You can kind of run, you can work out, you can sauna, uh, and there can be discomfort. But if it's not progressively worsening, you're, you're, I think you're okay. Mm. Do you guys think it would be a good idea just for us on this show, maybe to put forward like, get to a field or a yard, you know, your backyard, your front yard, wherever you got grass or a field of some sort, maybe like once a week or once a month, like rather like fuck the gym for the day, go out, get some sun, Mm -hmm. um, and trounce around barefoot in a field. Uh, maybe like maybe, maybe the first time you go, you're not even running. You're just doing squats and you're doing uh, lunges and doing push ups and you're going back and forth between some exercises like that rather than just like always thinking gym, gym, gym. I'm going to lock myself up in some shoes. I'm going to lock myself up inside. You think that that might be a great place to start? I think a little bit, 100% play. Me me and Bobby were having a walk and we 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 were shooting basketball. We were playing basketball. Go play basketball. Who won? Mm -hmm. I did. Definitely me. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely Bobby. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Go, go try something new. You don't have to. You don't have to go 110. percent There's times to go crush it and break a sweat and push your heart rate. But there's times to explore. I think we were talking about this in the gym. You showed me something really cool on the rack with the, uh, with your deep squat, mm-hmm. exploring some movement. Right. So go out into a field, 
play catch. I was talking to Bobby mm -hmm. about like, man, there we you have, you know how satisfying it is to get a glove on and a baseball? Mm. I played with my brother-in-laws uh, just this past Christmas. It's so satisfying to play a game of catch. I'm Maybe I'm a child, but like, go play catch. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. It's so satisfying. It's so rewarding. Yeah. Have you guys heard of pickleball? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I just heard about it this past weekend. But it's like, oh, I think mm -hmm. it's like there's there's tennis, there's pickleball, and then there's ping pong. And pickleball's ah. right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. But that's one of those things where it's like, you don't got to be good, but it's a fun thing to go move your body around mm -hmm. and just fucking play. Get some different types 100%. of movement. And you're not even really thinking about working out. No. You're just, mo you're just mm -hmm. moving. Activity. Yeah. yeah I, re I read some study a long time ago that's a, just a correlative study that's so, that said... The people that lived the longest, the activity that they did was it was by far racket sports. Mm. And ah. I, I just tried to kind of think why would that be? And I feel like it's it's a variable movement. You know, the ball's going. It's rare all to see over. a fat guy with a tennis racket. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that image though popped up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Trying to like think about it. And you're like, no, I don't think I can come up with any. I think you at three thirty just be standing on the yeah. baseline. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yeah. <laughs> can't get it. <laughs> but yeah, there's you're outside, you're playing. There's there's joy. You're also playing with somebody. Usually, uh, it's 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 movement. It's a lot of things. And I I think also the like the neuro enhancement aspect of movement is undervalued or sometimes sometimes underappreciated. Like how many times have you been told, well, I would like to work out, but I don't have the energy to work out. And then you're, you're kind of like, what you don't realize is if you started to move, you would have more energy, mm -hmm. not less. Mm -hmm. And so like last night, I mean, we do this for our jobs and for our like hobbies and passions. And even last night we're playing pickup basketball because we found a basketball and we're like, this feels good. Like we need to play more. We need to do more mm -hmm. sports as opposed to a rigid structure. I mean, I love the weight room. I love training, but and those are, yeah, don't take those from your life. We know how important uh, muscle mass is and everything like that, but it's like, Sometimes it's a reminder, even to us within this field, that we should just try saying things different or go play. I'm a, I'm a scuba diver, and like that gives me massive reward. I'm like, why am I not doing this all the time? Mm -hmm. And then when are you the sharpest? Like when you just got done training, when you just got out of the water, when you just got done juggling the, the soccer ball for you know half an hour, and you're yeah. like, I, I feel great. Your, your body's trying to tell you. Hey, can you keep doing this stuff? Like, I'm trying to give you these endorphins and this, this, uh, you know, these chemicals to tell you that this is this is a good thing. You bring up a really interesting point. Like, um, there's almost like no reflexes involved with lifting weights. Like, there's a, a reflex aspect mm -hmm. of seeing a ball bounce a particular way, mm -hmm. and it kind of reminds me of like a slip. You know, you slip on some ice or you slip on something, and sometimes, yeah, like that shit will hurt if you slipped pretty far. But a lot of times you'll slip and catch yourself or sneeze real hard or uh, some loud noise will go crazy. Mm -hmm. And your body moves and reacts in a way where you were like, I didn't even know I could fucking move like that. Yeah. You know, if we heard like gunshots in here right now, you would, we would all like, hopefully it would move pretty fucking fast. <laughs> yeah, like we'd yeah. have a, uh, a very like knee jerk, immediate Sympathetic. reaction to it. And you mm -hmm. don't really get that when, he, when it comes to lifting weights. So simply going out and throwing a football around it's great. You'll explore all the different things that you guys learned about each and every muscle and tendon ligament moving around just from somebody just running a pattern. You said uh, you played tight end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just somebody running a pattern and catching a ball. Uh, you're going to get all those things. We're trying to defend the guy who's trying to catch the ball, and it might be fun. Really fun. 100%. And if you can do all that with minimalistic shoes, that's probably <laughs> – mm -hmm. that's where we started on this, though. But, yeah, I mean, barefoot and grass and just nature – I mean, one of the things coming back from Iceland where I lived for eight years was just being out in the sun. I, I honestly was a little sad. I mean, I love Iceland with all my heart. It's one of the greatest places. Please visit. But I, I had my, my boy, and he's 18 months now. Yeah. And I just thought, I thought back to my childhood where I just had nothing on, a diaper on maybe, and I'm outside playing in the water hose, running through the mm -hmm. sprinkler, just barefoot in the sun. And I'm like, he's not going to have this. Mm -hmm. It's overcast most of the time or it's 50 mile an hour winds like it's just the weather's not great and you know, there's a whole bunch of other benefits but i just kind of had the sadness so there's there's a lot of things i'm looking forward to n nature wise and movement wise mm -hmm. that i can expose him to and you know people you know our, our family members are already saying like you need to cover up his feet he, <laughs> he, he needs shoes on he's outside mm -hmm. and i'm like he does not he, he's bleeding i don't care <laughs> there we go no shoes he's not i don't care if his, <laughs> his yeah. toes are bleeding why do you guys why do you guys think that if you were to like throw a ball to andrew that he could catch it down low 
and not have any consequences. But meanwhile, if he went to pick something up, you know, he would maybe, I guess, potentially have to think about it, but maybe not have to think about it. But like, why? Because I want to score the touchdown. <laughs> That's <laughs> you well, mentioned it's it. game. I mean, gamified. Yeah, yeah. You no. told this exact story mm-hmm. out there, right? Like, yeah. How if your son was going to fall down a stair or something, you'd be you'd be there instantly and you'd catch him, and it actually wouldn't hurt. Mm-hmm. But just bending over. That's a complicated question, I think. I mean, sometimes it's a, in a way. it's a mental thing, but mm-hmm. other times it's maybe the adrenaline and the, the strategy that you had to do without thought, without any thinking was actually quite okay. And I did ask you like, okay, maybe it didn't hurt when you did it, but may, is it did it hurt 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later? And that wasn't the case, right? No, yeah, it, it doesn't hurt. And, you know, after maybe the first time, I didn't even consider it or didn't think about it. But then as it happened again, I'm like, dude, I... Again, because we talked about like, you know, what, what hurts, what doesn't hurt. Like if I have to move quickly left and right or, you know, any switch directions, put it that way, um, I will have a hard time because I can't stay as um, as rigid and I can't stay as secure. But here I am sitting down on the floor, like crisscross applesauce and then like, oh shit, his head's going to hit that corner. I won't even think and I'll sprint across a room, like literally cover a whole ground, like of a room get him and be totally fine and then after consider it and be like how the like how did that happen like i'll try to like go back and you know decode what what just happened because i'll be like it didn't hurt getting up it didn't hurt sprinting it didn't hurt like stopping instantly to catch him because like i'm not going to run him over and then it doesn't hurt right now like why is that like i don't understand so i'm like okay i i didn't think about my back and it didn't hurt Hmm. okay what else is there (laughs) <laughs> you know, there has to be something else there, right? Well, ac- acutely, it's kind of easily explained by sympathetic response and adrenaline and trying to save your son from getting injured. What's fascinating is that it, maybe it doesn't hurt at all with time. So a lot of times, what, what I would expect is that maybe it does hurt 15 minutes later. Mm-hmm. Like now you're like, okay, I don't really know why, but my back's starting to kill me. That's not the case with you. So that's a, that is a fascinating factor mm-hmm. that that plays into the to to solve you know to diagnosing this can issue. you guys just tell andrew we've been trying to tell him can you just have him deadlift again for us <laughs> <laughs> and sam and i we just want him to deadlift you don't bring me into this i never said that all right <laughs> you want him you to need deadlift. to deadlift again doctor's orders <laughs> yeah. okay well how heavy though because ah oh, oh. you almost made it Close. well you were mentioning the principle of uh said i think you were mm-hmm. saying or is that what it was yeah, that's correct yeah. and what does that stand for specific adaptation to impose demands yeah. So Andrew uh, stopped uh, some heavy exercise for a while and decided to kind of move into doing some other stuff. And then I think it would be great for, I think he's starting to explore it again now, moving around some weights. Um, what are your guys' thoughts? Like, should he, you know, start to see if he can, you know, get get some weights uh, in his hand a little bit here and there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from what we've done already, like you need to prep and prime the system. You need to warm up properly, right? I mean, you need blood flow through those areas before you start to do these movements. And that's, I mean, that's that should be known. That should be kind of a basic. You should warm up, right? Um, but I, absolutely, you should do it. I, I don't see why not. You need to prep, it was you specifically, you got to do those exercises to prep, activate the glutes. Really, what, what we were doing there is to work on your position, the position of your hip and your back in relation to your femur. And so it's very important that position is key. And I know these guys can coach you through a position. I know that they can get you there. We have to set it on a more granular level. And then the key to staying better long-term is to progress it. You can't just live at that bottom level. So, mm-hmm. I mean, say, I say this with my patients all the time. And then the level, I'll be, the level past deadlifts is play. And so like the protecting of your son, the playing in your backyard, playing catch, but I think deadlifts are pretty high up there. So yeah, you're going to warm up, you're going to prep, you're going to get your position right, and then you're going to lift some heavy weights. And it's going to be fine. It truly will be. I mean, I've seen patients like yourself before. You're going to be fine. No, 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 no. You've never seen a back like mine. <laughs> I forgot about it. I haven't. You're right. And I shouldn't even necessarily <laughs> say deadlift. I guess just like hip hinge with some sort of weight. Exactly. Right? And then I guess 100%. that would be some type of deadlift, but... That's what we we're doing. I think I, yeah. we're always just thinking of like the bar and a yeah. straight bar, regular deadlift. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes puts a lot of stress. I haven't on. trained with a barbell in a long time now. Yes. Yeah. Free weights, cable machines, or regular machines. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was partially joking. Um, how unique like is my back? How unique is like your guys' patients' backs? Like, because, you know, we, we can kind of play the whole scenario, but like we all feel like, like, nah, dude, like, 
you don't understand. My back hurts. <laughs> and, you, know, and you guys are like, yeah, we, we have an idea. I'm like, no, 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 but mine's different. How different is it? You are a unique snowflake. <laughs> oh, <Yes>. snowflake. <laughs> the zebra stripes of the Sahara, bro. The, you're, there's only one Andrew. Yeah. But look, and so there is a recognition from a mental health standpoint in the beginning. If you're a clinician, you're a coach, you need to recognize that they, the patient, the person believes that this is like the only back situation like this in the world. And so if you bypass that, you are crossing boundaries and you're going to get kickback. You're going to get pushback. The patient is going to be like, you don't understand me. So in terms of that mental health stuff, you have to kind of recognize that coaches, trainers, before you can kind of push them, you have to earn that trust with the patient before you believe. I mean, you could definitely walk through a deadlift with these guys. You trust them. They're your friends. They're not going to push you there. But if you don't recognize that clinicians and coaches, first and foremost, that people think that they're unique and they are unique. I really, truly believe that for sure. Maybe the case, uh, mental, your mental idea of what's going on in your back is absolutely unique. The orthopedic and strategic movement patterns, uh, maybe not so unique. Mm -hmm. I do believe it. I do believe you're slightly unlucky though. Most people with low back injuries do recover quite well. They're either not bad enough where it's, it's bad for a week or two weeks and then they get better, or that's so bad that you need an immediate intervention. Like you need a steroid mm -hmm. injection, you need a discectomy to cure it. Mm. What kind of sucks is when you're in limbo. You're the, and there's even research to prove this as far as discs go. And it's, it's kind of interesting. The larger the disc herniation, the more likely it is to spontaneously uh, resorb or to go away on its own. Mm. So if you have, and that's, it's kind of like, think of the spinal canal as like an operating room. It needs to be clean. Anything inside that is bad news. That's mm -hmm. why they do these spinal taps, these lumbar punctures to see if there's anything in the spinal cord, if you have <clears throat> bleeding in that area, that thing's got to be pristine. So if you have this massive disc bulge or even material from inside the disc comes into the canal, the body goes, it sees it as a foreign invader, just like autoimmune stuff. Mm -hmm. it says, we got to get this out of here. And it, it takes it away. And then if you have too small of one, that's usually the person who like stiff for a couple of days, they have a hard time getting out of a chair. And then by the next week, they're back to deadlifting. They're like, there's no big deal. I've had a disc herniation, not that bad. Well, <laughs> the person in the middle is the tough one. Mm -hmm. They have been shown if it, if it persists more than six to 12 weeks, there's a really good chance it's persisting for mm -hmm. 18 months, 24 months, and they take time. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that is a little bit bad luck. That is not the majority of people. And I mean, I know this quite well because I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people that had to eat standing for six months because I didn't want sciatica if I had mm. dinner at the table. So I just ate standing and I didn't have my sciatica. So I, I've had to be in this position of, I didn't believe or I thought I had the skills to avoid surgery, but yet it wasn't so mild that it just got better with, with time or even rehab. I mean, I did tons of rehab and I eventually had to accept my fate and do long-term planning. So I do think you're in that camp, um, but there are things that prevent us from getting better that are really complex. Like the person who's doing muscle work on you, he's doing exactly what he should be, but for whatever reason, the next day, it's just as tight as it was uh, before you had the work done. So the mm -hmm. question is, is what's prevent it, preventing it from getting better? And that's, those are big questions. Those are hard questions. Yeah, and that's where I started kind of diving into the mental side of things recently because like i remember like i'd seen dudes in the gym like coming off of a squat and then all of a sudden it's just like they'll tweak it and then they can't walk and i'll be like oh dude like this is gonna like if you have any questions like i can help like I, you know don't worry about it and then two weeks later they're like 100 percent. they're like, maxing again like, what yeah. the f like mm -hmm. okay how did that happen and then it, it would happen again and again and i'm just like all right, dude, it's been over a decade. Like mm. what's, what's like, what's going on here? Like, am I like literally broken? Like what's like, why is this happening? So that's why I'm like, okay, maybe it's, it's not the physical side anymore. Mm. Like maybe I have to do some more mint. Like everyone tells me I need to do mushrooms. Uh, but you know, maybe I got them for you whenever you want them, honey. I do. Shoot. You guys hear that? And I ask like almost every day. Do you? Do yes. You? Okay. Been, I'll, I'll bring you three I, grams tomorrow. I've told you guys several times I want to do them and I have no idea how to get them. No, last time. time you took like half a stem. Yeah. What's that hero? What's it called? A hero, hero dosage? Yeah, yeah, hero dose that? is like, uh, I think, is it three grams five. or more? I think it's, it's five. Not, yeah, it's like five it's, or eight grams or some shit. It's ha crazy. Half a stem at work, guys. <laughs> like, come on. I got a job. <laughs> you know, before we, because I want to know about your sciatica, 
But I also right. want to know more about uh, what Mark was mentioning in terms of like, you know, using a lacrosse ball or something across different parts of your body, like the bottom of your foot and feeling some pain. Huge. When we had Mike Isertel on the podcast recently, do you guys know who Mike Isertel is? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. When we started talking about body work, he was someone who doesn't believe that body work is very effective. And he mentioned for himself, uh, massages are painful. That type of like myofascial, the, the like rolling on things is painful for him. For sure. um, and I was kind of surprised that he thought it wasn't necessarily that beneficial on Unless the athlete perceives it as I think beneficial. he mainly was saying there's not a lot of research behind not it. Not a lot of research behind it? Okay. I think yeah. that was kind of his main thing. That was his main thing. So I am curious if somebody does like, you know, Kelly Stretch Supernova. Mm. I started using that in maybe 2013 initially. Very painful. Mm. Um, but over time, like it'd be like it, it, it helped out. I was, it helped me become more supple in certain areas. I don't know exactly what happened to me, but it became a very easy tool to use, a non-painful tool to use. Mm -hmm. Was it because I just got used to that and it, I just didn't perceive as much pain or did a actual change happen to my different muscle fibers around my body? Is it actually as beneficial as maybe I think it is or no? Well, well, there's a there is an element of desensitization to the mm -hmm. tissue that's occurring. Yeah. So when you foam ro foam roll your IT band mm -hmm. day one, it's horrible for almost anybody. Yeah. If you foam roll it every day for even two minutes or something, mm -hmm. thirty seconds, eventually that that becomes no problem. Just like playing the guitar is terrible after one minute, yeah. and then eventually, of course, they can play whole concerts with with no uh, issues. Of course, yeah, there's some callousing and stuff, but it's the same idea. This desensitization occurs. What doesn't occur that I, I completely agree with Israel, by the way, is that we break stuff up and we create change in the tissue with our fingers. There's mm -hmm. research on that, yeah. Yeah, the, he's re, I think I, I listened to it. I think he was referring to these studies where you, you have to, like they take, they take tissue out of your body like an IT band and they put it between two, two vices, basically. And they say, mm -hmm. how much force does it take to deform that tissue by 1%? And it's like, it's way more than... Well, maybe Mark in your prime, but most people could never even lift those weights, much less I'm going to apply with my thumb mm -hmm. or my finger to that tissue. But there's other explanations that people like Schlepp or the fascia people would point out, which is that human tissue is active and it's a real thing and it's, it has the ability to change itself. So there's things like myofibroblasts and different tissues inside that respond. There's all these like mechanotransductors or uh, like things like- Can you explain what that is, by the way? Because you mentioned that, you guys mentioned mechanotransduction multiple times in the gym too. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, yeah. Like proprioceptors, mechanoreceptors. Okay. These type of cells, they sense things like pressure mm -hmm. or tension or speed, like a Golgi tendon organ. It, it, it senses- uh, rapid speed. So like before you, if you're sprinting and before you tear your hamstring off the bone, it's going to make you buckle or maybe even just fall down as yeah. opposed to rip the whole thing off the, uh, off the bone. Okay. These cells are what allow things to move. This is where like I can stick my elbow in Mark's back and then all of a sudden it lets go a bit and he can touch his toes where he couldn't before. Uh, that is the cells allowing tissue in the brain, mainly the brain, allowing this tissue to, to deform and become uh, different than what it typically is. Yes. But we didn't actually change that tissue from a molecular structure standpoint. Mm -hmm. I mentioned MUA, like a manipulation under anesthesia. Yeah. So you take somebody after maybe knee surgery, you try to bend their, their knee and like nothing, it barely goes. You knock them out and you can push their heel to their butt. And they yeah. do this. They actually put them in a device that they put on their knee and it just for like an hour just moves their heel to their butt, like, like a robot. Like Does that robotic. cause like a lot of trauma or? They are sore after it, okay. but they mm -hmm. wake up and they're like, my knee moves now, oh, you know, because wow. they never could have done that uh, conscious, awake. Mm -hmm. Do they do that to people that don't need surgery? Yeah, there are. There is it a, are I mean, is it a <laughs> practice? Can I sign up for this? Yeah, can it be a practice? <laughs> yeah. um, in certain states, I think it's washed. There's like if your body's stiff, I mean, right? There's a, there's a very popular chiropractor on TikTok, Instagram who commonly will adjust people under anesthesia, like goes to a hospital, puts them under and cracks them head to toe. Uh, how do you feel about that? You guys, how do you guys feel about that? I, I, I plead the fifth on this one. Really? Huh. What about <laughs> from a mobility okay. standpoint? We'll talk about that shit off air. Well, if, that it's sounds working, interesting. if it's working from a standpoint of like uh, somebody just had surgery, would it make some sense that it might work otherwise? I mean, chiropractic yeah, yeah. is one thing, but I'm talking about like just range of motion. Would that... Do you guys think it would be helpful or does yeah. it 
body maybe not respond well to that or I just pleaded the fifth on that person, by the way. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not on the, know con- okay, on the con- on concept. Okay, on the concept in the concept, general. concept, I mean. Yeah. Like, could Mark get some benefit? I would say if there's no orthopedic block in his knee where it's 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 literally, we call it infeel. Yeah. Take a joint to the end of the range of motion. You guys licensed to do this? Let's do it. <laughs> I, no, we are not. No. Um, this is so, not our I think it's area. like Washington and Oregon, those hippies up there. Road they let trip. you do anything. Uh, well, we don't give a fuck if you're licensed. Just knock them out and do this shit. Yeah, it'll be fun. He can just choke me out and you guys can do whatever you want. We Perfect. give you consent. <laughs> we got Even about, the brown stuff? Just give me mushrooms? <laughs> not for me, maybe for him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, I, I mean, that was mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> What's in this mind bullet? Because I am flying. It's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> we can't tell you. Amazing. No, it it is valuable. There's value everywhere. I mean, people if they it wouldn't be a thing if people didn't find value at times. This is where it goes back to the assessment. And there are people who are worse, and there are people who are better after it. So I mean, you it's unique, absolutely. Yeah, I just feel like if you know, I was if I had if I was completely unconscious, you guys would be able to move my hips like way easier and way better. And I just. I don't know, I feel like maybe if he created a pattern there so right. many times over and over, maybe when I snap out of it, it might still be there. That's the key. That's the trick, actually. Because going back to it, what Israel was talking about, massage is not good, or people talk about the foam roller or whatever is not good. How does that translate uh, rolling on a foam roller and an IT band to then, say, running a 5K and having it not? So there's really the, creating a pattern. They're saying that, an, that a lacrosse ball or... Um, a foam roller will not is enough to break up some muscle and get your Golgi tendons to chill out a little bit and maybe desensitize the issue. But does that translate to you actually being able to bend over better? Mm. So there's a big gap there, basically. And if you're a good clinician, what you do is you go, okay, we loosen it up and then we progress you very slowly, which we've been talking about constantly. But that leap, I understand what Israel is saying. There is a leap there that people make. They're like, just foam roll everything and you'll be better. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. And then when it comes to active release therapy... That's a therapy that was developed where you are taking somebody through a range of motion as you're, you know, supposedly like scraping away the scar tissue. And maybe you are, maybe you're not, but you are probably uh, reinforcing like I'm getting rid of this pain by sticking my thumb into your whatever thigh and I'm going to move your leg as I'm doing this and you're going to move. Uh, It still will hurt, but it will hurt differently. It's like the normal pain that you feel is uh, it's like put on pause for a half second and then you have pain just because somebody's putting pressure into a particular spot. Pattern interrupts. Pattern interrupts and pattern creation. The thing is you can't just rug pull something. This is one of the things with meditation that people make a mistake on. Meditation is a mind fast. And if you don't put anything else in there, if you go and fast for a day and then go back to McDonald's, it's it's still not good, right? <laughs> like you need to put something good in there. So once you ART, once you the cross ball, once you foam roll, what are the next steps? What are you then going to put back in? And I think that's where people miss the boat and where the research is correct. Um, that's my problem with systems. You got to bring a bunch of them in together. Yeah, I think I think manual therapy, manual therapy, massage, all these tools, K Star stuff. I think it it all is just a tool, but mm-hmm. it's 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 like the story doesn't end there. That's passive therapy, and mm-hmm. I actually don't do that much manual therapy anymore. And I have noticed very little difference in my outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, I still believe it's in, entirely valuable, uh, but it's a tool. So that I do agree with Isertel. Like you, you can't just use your, you know, use some tool and scrape out the tissue, and then they're going to be better tomorrow. Like there's mm-hmm. no said principle, right? There's no other input that's supposed to like help that improve. All you're saying, like you loosen something up, but why was it tight in the beginning? Many things are tight because they're weak. So they get tight to lock things down and you get stability now. So you, if you're not strong enough, it just gets tight. Uh, it prevents that, that way you, you don't fall over and we fight gravity. So that's going to do nothing for your weakness. So, but what, what these manual therapies are great for is getting you to feel something, maybe temporarily unlocking, we'll quote, unlocking something. So if, if Mark couldn't feel his hip on an exercise or his glutes and we do some muscle work and some extra stuff and he said, ah, now I can feel it. Okay, now we train that thing, and now we get a better said response or a specific adaptation mm-hmm. when he goes to load it. Because before he couldn't feel it, maybe he was in a bad position, and now when you load it, those fibers get the the kind of stress and the mechanotransduction, that that word you wanted me to explain. It's mm-hmm. basically a, a stress through a tissue that allows it to get stronger. 
bones do this too. It's called the piezoelectric effect where you stress bone and there's like crystal and energy that basically, not that kind of crystal energy, but that allows it to lay down more bone. And that none of that occurs through passive modalities, passive treatments. So, I mean, I'm just a massive proponent of active movement. That's why it comes back full circle. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes people like you guys, hands-on all day long with maybe somebody in the gym or personal trainers, they, they have often... They may not know all the, have all the skills, but they probably have the best chance to create the biggest change in people sometimes because they're just with them all the time and they're, they're right there. And I wish like um, cl clinics, uh, chiro clinics, PT clinics looked a lot more like a gym. You know, let me hang from, you hang from this bar, oh, it hurts, your left shoulder hurts, let's put an input, hang from it again, it's gone. And we know we made a change. Is it permanent? We don't know yet. But we know we made a change versus a, a sterile clinic environment. You know, they're coming in because it hurts on the third snatch. Yeah. And I'm going, well, here's an orthopedic test. That's negative now. I have no idea if it's going to improve their snatch. Mm -hmm. So I wish in the, I hope in the future, you know, clinics, at least for the non-medical, you know, hospital type of setting, looks a little bit more like a gym, you know, yeah. like mm -hmm. where my man here works. Or Aaron, you guys had Aaron on here, Squat U. Mm -hmm. His his clinic is is very it's a it's a gym. Same I with mean, Stu McGill. Same as Stu. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Legend, yeah. And there's this other guy, Oscar, uh, who mm -hmm. Mark Mark actually introduced me to, and I do some work with him now. He exactly, he has like a squat rack, a bunch of bands, a bunch of things in his clinic. It's like I think there are a lot of people that are starting to take that approach and seeing how useful it is. I won't go as far as like Pavel Sasulin, who was like, I won't go see a chiropractor unless he can deadlift 400 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't mind that. That's a good chiropractor, I bet, though. Yeah. Bobby, you were mentioning your sciatica and how you had to stand for six months. Did you actually mm -hmm. manage to fix that? Is it still a reoccurring issue? I, I have the ability to recreate my sciatica if I want. Oh. It mm -hmm. takes a lot more now. I'm very, I don't really have to think about it. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I <laughs> slouch as hard as I can for a, a four-hour car ride... I can create some discomfort. It goes away really fast now, though. Mm -hmm. So before, I mean, like, I, mean, I wasn't able. I wasn't even able to do the McGill Big Three. Mm -hmm. Just doing like a, a bird dog would elicit like a punch to my calf. So <sighs> I mean, I and again, it's a little bit about it's luck. Bad. It Damn. just happens to be a disc that is lateral and sits right in this recess where the nerve exits. Eventually, I got imaging, but I mean, at this point, I'm like. This is going to be a disc bulge right in this lateral area. And that's exactly what came back. And it's that medium-sized bulge that tends to not go away on its own. Medium bulge. Uh, medium <laughs> bulge. <laughs> Could be worse. Could, Could be. be. Could be worse. So, um, yeah, so my advice for those people would be the first thing is definitely the McGill type of stuff, which is just stop triggering it. You know, that is, that is step one. Right? If you have a cut and you just keep rubbing it and it keeps bleeding, you just start over. Like, you're just stuck. So the first stop, the first thing is to stop triggering it. But eventually you do have to grow. You have to move forward. And that's, if you're in my position, I highly recommend some professional help for guidance to go through that path. I, I, I honestly believe most people would have had a surgery uh, in my situation because mm. it didn't respond to anything. It took so much time. And if I had sought out orthopedic help, they would say, well, we'll just do a discectomy you know, it, it's minimally invasive and you'll be, you'll be fine. You know, that's, and sometimes you are, and sometimes they have these uh, operations and they are not better afterwards, especially in long term. So a lot of times with these outcomes, when you look at the studies, Im immediately after operation, a, menis a meniscectomy, taking out a meniscus, immediately after the results are better with mm -hmm. surgery. In the long run, they tend to equalize. And I was okay with that. I was okay to play the long game, but I have some s set of skills some very specific <laughs> yeah. that, that allow me to be okay with it. I, I knew that I was not going to blow it out completely and have caught equina syndrome where you, 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 you shit yourself and you didn't know you do it. Mm. That's, you guys have that? I am. Yeah. I've been squatting time. sometime. After yeah. Chipotle for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that actually, that happened to me the other day. Oh, no. <laughs> like I was like, yeah, Chipotle? What happened? no, I didn't have Chipotle, but oh. I don't remember what I was doing, but I, I was like, hmm, I pushed and little shit came out. I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I was, it was no. so yeah. embarrassing. No. <laughs> you have to get to a certain level where you're just like, oh no, yeah. like again, <laughs> like, it's not it like sucked. a, it's not like a scare truck. What just happened? It was like, oh no. Did you mess yourself or did the deep? Deep cheeks come in handy. Deep nah, cheeks. Deep hit the boxers. Oh, hit the boxes man. a little bit. I, I had to change it up. But I was at home, moisture. so it was okay. <laughs> like, Skid marks. Golly. It, it, it kind of sucked. The uh, the three of us, we love uh, our cold plunge tubs. Uh, so, you know, we like to get real cold. Um, I did it 
so I, I've been doing it every day for a couple, well, like two weeks now, went on vacation. So the day I left, I did it. The day I came back, I did it. So I missed three whole days. I really missed it. Um, when I'm in there, again, this could be a mental thing. My back doesn't hurt at all. I don't feel anything. <laughs> I feel the cold water. Uh, it feels awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had, uh, uh, what was his name? Brandon uh, Funye. Funye. He recommended uh, contrast therapy for mm-hmm. like, you know, aches and pains and stuff. And I, I got to like, when, when I, again, when I'm in it, I feel great. When I get into the shower afterwards, I feel great. But then as time passes, it's like it'll slowly come back. But I still overall feel amazing. Uh, what's your guys' take on like contrast therapy or even just cold therapy? I love I love a good cryotherapy person. Mm, I've not really? done the, I've not done the uh, the, cold? the cold plunge. Oh man! Um, I had a clinic that was close to a cryo, and like it, it was great for me. Uh, uh, my wife benefited greatly from it. She had uh, some insomnia issues, and sorry, Jess, if you didn't want people to know that. No, they uh, she had beautiful, my lovely, beautiful wife. <laughs> but no, she did cryotherapy a couple times in a row, and I, I was kind of skeptical about it at first as well. But when your girl can sleep, I mean, it's great. I mm. mean, when she, when she gets rest. So in terms of uh, that's all, that's my, my uh, experience with it. But I, yeah, have you uh, messed uh, with it at all? I have done a lot of it personally. And I think to answer your question like directly is everything can work for someone. And I think I, I don't want to ever put somebody down like because I maybe don't agree with what they say is helpful. So I think if it's helpful, that, that's it. Yeah. It works, feels mm-hmm. good. But it does make sense, like the the heating pad idea. You know, people with low back pain, they always had these heating pads everywhere, like one in their car, one in their office, Mm -hmm. one in their couch. (laughs) And it's like, it only feels good when it's on, and if they don't use it, or an hour later, it feels worse. But you just, there's something called an analgesic. You know, analgesic is ibuprofen, it's ice. Ice is an analgesic. Mm -hmm. So you feel, if you're numb, you can't feel it. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually one of the ways that that medicine diagnoses things. They use something like like a nerve block, or they inject something so... Is it is before they do the operation? We want to know this pain's actually coming from this structure. Mm-hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to numb it, and then we're going to try to irritate it. And if you don't feel it, there's a good chance that when we take it out, it's going to be beneficial, right? So these analgesics have an effect like that. From our perspective, it's great for sometimes diagnosis to know. Even rubbing something for a really long time, like James Syriac, old orthopedic, like it's called transverse friction. It has this numbing effect. So if I want to know that the pain's coming from your patellar tendon. I can rub rub it back and forth for, Syriax did it for like 20 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes. And what will happen is that you'll be so desensitized to that painful, that nociceptive tissue in the patellar tendon that he'll be able to squat without pain. And that'll be brief though, but it does have- What if you were just to like smash someone's toe? Would it do the same thing? Basically. Where's the pain? Yeah, like <laughs> yes. a major pain style. Yeah, yeah. You remember that? Yeah, your, right, your right knee hurts. Someone just fucking takes a little hammer and goes boop right to your toe. Yeah, yeah. Does that Fix displace it. the, 100%. like if I did a squat, would I not feel it? That that's that's, that's kind of the Poliquin like jaw trick as right? well. Like it's a little bit, look over here. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And you're not thinking anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Remember that's Major Pain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where he's like, here, give me your finger. <laughs> he just <Yeah>. snaps it. <laughs> Maggots. Yeah, I love that movie. Yeah, that's, that's, that's old school. Yeah. What fucking old I, uh, movie is this? Dude, it's super old. You don't know yeah. Major Wayans, Pain? It's Wayans, Wayans, Wayans Brothers. Da- yeah, da- is it Dame? No, yeah, not. Damon Wayans. Damon Wayans. It was him, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. I feel bad for not knowing it. I Dude, it's like so I good. It's, uh, it's probably kind of annoying these days but at that time it was really funny you don't have a forehead you have a five head when i salute i salute like this <laughs> it's a great movie <laughs> oh that uh, reminded me of mark go actually go ahead you you have oh some. i was just gonna say i had sciatica pretty bad when i was like hmm. but I, luckily for me i was like 20 years old 19 20 yeah. years old and so it just went away i you know went to the mm-hmm. doctor they looked at my thing they were like uh you know they looked at my mri or whatever the hell it was that they mm-hmm. did and they're like, this is really bad. You need to get surgery. And they said back fused. And I was like, I'm out. Like mm-hmm. as soon as I have a spinal fusion, I'm like, I don't know what that means. It sounds horrible. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like I may never recover from that. But I think I can just recover from this, even though it was hard to go to the bathroom. Uh, laughing was like out of the question. Sneezing was out of the question. I mean, mm-hmm. but it was, you know, when you're living in that moment, it seems like it's forever. But For honestly, sure. it was probably like about six months or so. Mm-hmm. Um, I was playing football and I was like sprinting and lifting and trying to like get myself in shape for that. And then just, uh, one day just woke up and just could barely walk. And I was mm. like, what in the fuck is mm-hmm. this? Um, the, when, the, when I went to the doctor, they said, you know, not to really do much of anything. So I was like, 
all right, for the first time in my life, I'll actually take that advice because like I can't move. So I don't know what the, you know, results of me like trying to go in the gym and trying to deadlift or something uh, would be. And so I took uh, a few weeks and I was like, I felt like I was getting worse. And so I'm like, I'm just going to write down a bunch of things that I can do and I'll Mm -hmm. stick with that. And I won't worry about what I can't do. And so I was like, I could do curls. I could do certain (laughs) machines. I can do this. I can do that and stay away from stuff that hurts. And I did that. And then again, eventually, you know, luckily again, I was super young. So my body was very resilient to be able to, Hmm. but it just went away after a while. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've talked before with guys uh, like Stan Efforting on the show. And we talked about physical therapy and chiropractic and all these different things. And Stan's like, you know what? A lot of times just like six or eight weeks goes by. (laughs) Was it the ibuprofen? Was it the doctor? Was it like, no one really knows. It's hard to, uh, you know, dial it back very specifically to like research. Is that kind of, is that feel like it's true? Like, is that what you guys have found? Like maybe in a disappointing way as being people that are trying to help people with the best you can? Very fair. Very I, reasonable. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think we want to think that everybody who never comes back to our clinic, we fixed. But it, but there's a really good chance that those people just went somewhere else because the problem came back. And then they're like, well, they didn't fix me. And then you don't know that they're at three other clinics in the next year. Mm. Uh, but just before I forget this point on the disc, there used to be no evidence that supported that discs responded to mechanotransduction. Just think of mechanotransduction as any kind of load going through the t- any stress, whether it's tangential stress or compressive force, it doesn't matter. But there's been recent evidence just in the last couple of years that supports through research studies that the disc itself actually can respond to mechanotransduction or it will use mechanotransduction to heal or to grow tissue, which I-, I read that study. It came out as I was in the middle of stuff. So it was actually quite optimistic for myself as somebody who's worrying I'm really happy you didn't do a fusion. I don't think you would be where you're at today, especially, or what you had accomplished in your sport Mm -hmm. if you would have gotten a fusion. There's a chance, some people get double hip replacements and still do amazing things, and other ones never picked up their their activities ever again the same way, not even close. So uh, I do think the body can, I'm a big believer of, of adaptation. Uh, And you're somebody, like you just said something that I spent a lot of money (laughs) On to learn, which could is have just, saved you some bucks. You could have saved <laughs> yeah, you some bucks, yeah, yeah. which is like do what you can though, and oh, do as huge. much as you can. Walk up to the precipice or the cliff, but don't fall over, and just do those. I mean, you just it just comes intuitively to you. Where other people might need a little bit more trauma, a little bit more wake up. Like stop doing that. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Stop deadlifting. You finally need to stop deadlifting and get something pull back a little bit and then bring it back in. So, like to answer your earlier question, like I, I hope he does start getting into stuff again, but. Don't push them too fast and let them yeah, let them adapt. Absolutely. Yeah. Like in terms of the six to eight things as well, though, I don't want people listening to take that as an excuse that like it's just going to get better as well. Like if you have had it for six to eight weeks and you've maybe tried some stuff on your own, yeah. it, go see somebody. Like people are like, ah, it'll just get better. Ah, it'll just get better. I see these people. I'll be like, hey, how long have you uh, had your back pain, Mark? And they'll be like. Six months, nine months, and I'm like, bro, where have you been? <laughs> now we got to start on this. So I mean, there is a point. Let it, let it, give it a, sh- a chance to heal on its own for sure. But if not, like, go see somebody. <laughs> this makes me wonder real quick, like, what you guys would uh, suggest that people observe because we're lucky enough to know individuals like yourself, Kelly Sturet, a bunch of people who we've been able to have on, um, who we like, we trust their input. But if somebody just goes to a clinic and an individual just wants to start cutting into them, and this is a professional, yeah. Um, what? And I know it's case to case and dependent on that. But what are some red flags? You know what I mean? Because, like, for example, my meniscus, I ended up having a meniscectomy, so I had part of it removed, and I'm good now. But, for example, that doctor told me post-surgery, um, he said, you shouldn't move any. You, you should stay off this leg for a good four weeks. Don't do any type of exercise. Don't do much. And uh, who was it that I, I talked to? Uh, there's this coach that we know who works with a, an NBA team who I messaged, and he's like, start doing these things immediately. And I, within two and a half weeks I was back in the gym Schlesinger it wasn't Schlesinger for this one it was it was somebody else hmm. bald white guy he's married to a black lady you know oh. what I'm talking about doesn't, doesn't Louis Simmons have en- these These are endless stories from him mm-hmm. they told him to change yeah, everything, everything. And he's everything. like no I'm going in tomorrow mm-hmm. like his stories of like his, his wound from 
is still bleeding as he's oh, like yeah. he's bench pressing the next day. Yeah. <laughs> but it makes me wonder Jeez. in these situations, it's like if I did listen to the professional, maybe I wouldn't have good range back in my knee, but I had somebody who really knew what I should be doing. Mm. So what do people need to be looking out for when they go to a chiropractic clinic or any of these clinics to try to get help? Are you are you talking about like red flags? Red flags in terms of like bad clinicians or red flags yeah. in your body? Like is it like if sciatica goes past the knee and your foot is numb for a minute, like that's when we start to wonder about things like pain that goes down the leg. Or are you talking about like if you go see a doctor and a doctor says, "Let's hit both." Okay. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, going back, going back to what we were talking about with Mark, progressively worsening symptoms are not good. Yeah. If it's just getting worse and getting worse and getting worse, see a doctor. I mean, and you also, I think like word of mouth in terms of finding a clinician, like if if you had a good experience with them, good bedside manner, like do a little bit of research. You might research stuff for yourself, but research the doctor as well. Like mm -hmm. there's information out there. You can go see someone. The problem, one of the problems is the insurance. Like we could, that's a whole other rabbit hole, but like mm -hmm. some people are just more affordable. That doesn't make them better, right? Um, and, and they could be totally fine. Um, what would you look out for in cl clinicians? That's an interesting uh, question. That's a great question. I think people that spend time with you, people that ask questions, yeah. ask good questions. You know, they, they don't just ask two, three, like how long has it been going on? Where is it? And they kind of like lean under the table, you know, look around the table and they look at your knee because mm -hmm. you're saying you have mm -hmm. knee pain. But somebody that takes the time to evaluate it fully and mm -hmm. um, you know, they ask good questions. You don't feel rushed. I mean, that's definitely the people I would look for. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard, though. and It's really it's hard. I mean, it's geographic. You only have so many choices. Yeah. Are you willing to travel? Uh, a lot of these things. And also, on the other side, though, just because they do have a massive following yeah. or they are expensive, does not. It's not, commens it's not like it's a linear line with how... How, uh, ec how how much their expertise or how good they are or what kind of mm -hmm. outcomes sometimes sometimes mm -hmm. but not always so it's yeah I think I think people will intuitively kind of know this right like he didn't even look at it and he just prescribed this medicine that's a big one I mean especially and I don't blame them these the family care physicians you know your general practitioner they don't yeah. have any time they get like seven minutes with every patient they don't have time to to do a bunch of tests on a table and <laughs> see what's weak and stuff. Mm. But what what they should do, what what's responsible from their perspective is to refer them, to send them to a PT, to send them to a Cairo that will take the time to look deeper. So yeah, somebody that that's telling you they have all the answers is, a, is another red flag, I would say. Like this is the only place to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a certain Cairo school because the other one I shadowed said, this is the only Cairo school. Like you should mm. just go here. And then I went to look at the other one I shadowed and they were like, hey, if this isn't for you, don't come here. And I was like, these are my people. These are my people. I'm going to this school. Mm -hmm. Like that's how simple my choice was is because I could relate to that. You know? What happens when you guys uh, don't accept insurance? Like uh, you can do that as well, right? You can for sure. go private, right? And then cash, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, people go, go cash all the time. Yeah. You just price people out sometimes. Is that what happens? 100%. Or yeah. don't, don't people, they feel sometimes like they're, like they're, they're already paying for something, yeah. their insurance, mm -hmm. and they want to they want to use it. I'm paying for this thing I have. I want to get something out of it. That's a big problem for them to say. But you guys I, aren't using like, uh, I don't think you guys are using like a lot of uh, like medical stuff. So does the price get like, you know, does it get multiplied five times like when you go into like a hospital? I mean, if it's an emergency situation, yeah, they, it definitely does. Um, yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah. This is not my area. I've been in Iceland for eight years in totally different system. So I, I'm out of the loop on the, the How's insurance. it work in Iceland? Mm -hmm. Well, it, all chiropractic in Iceland is, uh, is basically cash. Mm -hmm. and, and there is socialized medicine over there. So like, for example, I mean, we have an emergency cesarean and, a, and, a, and an ambulance. And there's, there's zero bill. Of course, you play, pay it through your taxes and stuff. But, mm -hmm. but it's a different system. And chiropractic specifically in Iceland is just a cash system. Like you just pay. For it and there's things called unions almost everybody's in a union and they'll reimburse some of it kind of like what an insurance company will do like a deductible versus mm -hmm. the entire amount it's a similar system over there but i don't know anything currently about what's going on with the uh, u.s insurance and and chiropractic or pt and pts after, typically get a lot more coverage by the and way. after years of doing chiropractic um how do you guys feel about it like do you feel like the actual chiropractic like cracking stuff um are you for it? Are you have you found it to not be as maybe effective as you thought, or is it more effective than you thought? Like, where's your stance on it? I'm mostly against it. 
Straight, just straight up. Like I, I, I don't find benefit myself in it. I haven't seen it being reproducible um, in a lot of people. Um, what case would you use it? Is there a case where you would use it or not really? Not anymore. For sure. There are cases. Um, if we're going to go back to the mental health aspect of things as well, if people think they need an adjustment, uh-huh. ad- ad- adjustments seem to work really well on those people mm. I've found. Um, I like some extremity adjustment. Honestly, there's some there's some foot stuff uh, that's really good. There's some there are some good manipulations um, as a piece of the treatment, as like uh, you know the mashed potatoes in a meal mm-hmm. situation. So for sure, there's and, and honestly, one of the things about manipulation is that is a very skilled thing to do. So young chiropractors, if you've been if you've been doing it for two or three years. If you've been lifting for two or three years, it's the same thing. There's someone who's been lifting for 10 years and it's very different. So if you could, there are people who are that skilled at it and it's a very small percentage of people. Let's be totally honest. You can fe- hear that like ASMR pop that people mm-hmm. love. Yeah. And back, that's, God bless, fantastic. Want to take it? What's your, what's your opinion? I'll just, yeah. I, I do think it's effective, uh, but I don't, I think the story that, we're told is incorrect or incomplete. Mm. So, for example, you know, when 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 you go to chiro school or you go to a chiropractor as a patient, they'll tell you that well, when I adjust you, I'm basically going to realign things, yeah. like yeah. as if it was that easy. <laughs> it, it's just it's like as if you just went in and you picked up one pound and did one curl and you just looked like Ronnie Coleman the next day. That would be so convenient. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. And also there's this other chiropractic idea that when everything's in alignment, uh, the nervous system works better. And mm. there's not a lot of evidence to support that because mm-hmm. it's such a broad statement. It's not even like studyable, you know what I mean? But what I do, th- I do think this stuff works, but maybe on a, <laughs> from a scientific perspective, on a different uh, method. So let's say you put somebody, you ever had your low back cracked? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So they put you on your side and they drag one, the top leg mm-hmm. up real high mm-hmm. and they twist you and they crack. Well, there's a logical explanation for why, okay, pain is different, but let's just say you actually are better. Like you get up and you couldn't touch your toes and now you can, right? There's an explanation besides alignment and nervous system um, stuff that we get taught or preached at these clinics, which is that when you put a rapid stretch into tissue that's already at end range, you elicit these Golgi tendon organs, these Mm. cells. Might have got the same response if you had me catch a ball. Yeah, like a rapid stretch. Yeah, exactly. Hundred like percent. Threw a ball. Your my kid, feet and I or, caught it. Yep. Maybe you, I'd have the same. Or boom. your kid is falling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or yeah. stick my elbow in your back, and boom, you create inhibition, mm-hmm. and the muscle like temporarily lets go a bit. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but I feel great. Not to mention, what are joints? This is an easy one. What are joints meant to do? Move muscles through space. Be move. Just move. Smoked. That's yeah. Like they, they are there to, to create movement, yeah. right? There, there's, a, there's a space in the, end of, in the middle of my arm that is a joint that allows me to drink mm-hmm. whatever I want to drink, right? That's a, the joint is just meant for movement. And when you move, it, it's, it's what allows fluid to move around. In the, in the spine, we call this imbibition. You squeeze the disc and it pushes water out. It's like a sponge. It pulls it back in. This is how we move nutrients around. It's the same with the joint. You know, like we used to think you crack your knuckles, your fingers, they get thicker, right? you get arthritis. And mm-hmm. they actually studied this and they found absolutely no change or possibly a benefit. What? And it's like, like it's almost like, duh. Let you it know? out, let it out. My oh, shit doesn't yeah. even crack anymore, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, it's probably, I know. It yeah. so it's like, good. It never it, cracks. And it's kind of like, duh. <laughs> it, it should have a positive benefit. Because joints are meant to move. Mm-hmm. Right. And when you move them, the fluid gets to get pushed around and nutrient, you know, like you, you train and blood gets pushed around. It's like, there's all these massive benefits to that. So the joints actually get to, maybe that person has just been stuck in Stuckville for, for a year. <laughs> and then you finally force the low back to move enough to, and the pop just comes because you created enough movement to separate the joint mm-hmm. that there's a change of pressure inside, right? So like people know like chiro- opening a Pepsi bottle. People know chiropractic because of the popping. And mm-hmm. what you're maybe proposing is maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the popping. Because sometimes you go to move someone around, it doesn't make any noise. But because you moved them in a quick fashion, maybe that's something that helps. And maybe it would be similar uh, if 
you were to put weight or pressure on an area, that could also have a benefit, right? There's maybe multiple ways to get to the same thing. The pe- the people that benefit the most, honestly, from adjustments are often uh, really deconditioned. Like, and, and same, same thing with people that benefit from manual therapy or massage. Like someone does manual therapy and massage on your back uh, versus someone who spends time on their couch it's going to be far more beneficial to that deconditioned person because yeah. there's a novel stimulus and it really will change them. I mean, they will experience a difference because anything is good than the nothing that's happening to their body. Mm-hmm. Guys, these legendary tasty pastries have changed the game. They're 20 grams of protein, five grams of carbs. If you were a kid and I was a kid that ate pop tarts, mm-hmm. um, those things tasted great. But the difference, man, Andrew, what are the macros on Pop-Tart? Yes, for a regular Pop-Tart, we're looking at 190 calories, 37 carbs, 16 grams of sugar, and only 2 grams of protein. As comparison to a tasty pastry, we're looking at only 180 calories, 5 net carbs, 0 sugars, and 20 grams of protein. And this bad boy is gluten-free. There you go. That's right. And they taste so good. Like, I'm eating it cold. I got here a little bit of coffee. <laughs> it's so good, though. You guys can warm this up, man. Yeah. They have so many flavors on their website, too. You have to check them out, Andrew. Yeah, Bro. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You guys got to head over to eatlegendary.com. Uh, they have tons of different things. They have almonds. They have butters. They have amazing flavored everything, and everything, everything is all health conscious. Everything has low to no sugar. They have nut butters. <laughs> they have nut butters, and you can't help but smile when you say nut butters. But head over to eatlegendary.com and use promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Um, links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. I know it sounds like we're overhyping it, but I promise you we are not. You guys have to go try these tasty pastries right now. Yeah, and there's some stuff to back this up. You know, A lot of the chiropractors will point out research that shows after a manipulation, power output went up. But mm-hmm. it's 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 like I said, it's they're not wrong. It's almost like the the explanation for why there's improvement seems <clears throat> to be the disconnect, in my opinion. It's like oh, it's explained by the fact that now you have tissue that's more in a in a better position or relaxed or more neutral. We like to say sometimes it's kind of sitting where it's supposed to be, mm-hmm. so you'll be able to generate better power afterwards. So there's just a lot of other explanations that are maybe more <laughs> caught up with the research and the literature to support what chiropractic's actually doing. But I am somebody that manipulates and thinks that is that it is beneficial. Mm-hmm. I want to yeah. ask this because the, uh, there are probably individuals who are PTs or chiros that are listening to this. Um, and you guys even mentioned that you didn't just go to school. You, after that, you've continued and are continuing to learn more things from different clinics, different practitioners, et cetera. So for an individual who has gone through, what are some other areas that you think they need to start paying attention to or areas that they need to start expanding and learning from? Because I would assume that individual who just goes to chiro school, if it's if it's a small town and they have their clinic, they might be they might do well financially, but they're probably behind as far as application uh, versus guys like yourselves and other people who are leaders in that field. There are there are a lot of courses, there are a lot of schools. Um, I went on a rabbit trail. I guess I can talk about my personal experience, like. I, one of my first influences is actually Kelly Starrett. I remember I literally would watch like a playlist of his videos and I was just like, I want to be able to think about the body the way that Kelly thinks about the body. Um, you can get their methods and and do the techniques, but until you can really be like, I understand what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. From Kelly, I found this guy named Gray Cook, FMS, SFMA guys, brilliant stuff. They did a collaboration. I was like, okay, what's going on? And I, after Greg Cook, I read the book Movement like three times. There's a squat on, there's a chapter on squats in movement that I literally rewrote myself. Like I just- Who's it by? Uh, Greg Cook. It's by Greg Cook? Okay. A great read. Uh, very accessible as well, especially for trainers and people that listen to this. Um, and that, that chapter on squats like blew my mind. Then I kind of- I, I'm a guy that looks at the um, the appendix and I'm like, who are you referencing? Where did you get your stuff from? Mm-hmm. Who is this Louis Simmons you guys keep talking about and what does he know? And so I, w- I took another step back. I went from Greg Cook, then I went to this thing, uh, Vladimir Yanda and Pavel uh, Voida. Not Vaclav Voida. Vaclav Voida. Yeah. Uh, Pavel Kolar is, uh, Kolash is the main guy that went from them. Uh, Yanda is the guy who, you've heard of open, uh, lower cross syndrome or upper cross syndrome. 
so people will be like, you know how your pecs are tight and your rhomboids are weak? Okay. You have an anterior pelvic tilt and your hip flexors are tight. And you're yeah. like, There's tonic and phasic muscles. Yonda kind of was the originator of this. Wow. Um, and so I went back to even that and where they that came from. Uh, so that's this, these days, uh, Vladimir Yonda has a, a book. He has a, a, a cohort named Carol Lewitt. Uh, Carol Lewitt is also kind of one of the forefathers in our world. Re read his book, his books many times. Um, you kind of have to search for him these days, but like if you want to know where physical therapy kind of came from, you got to go to the roots. And these guys are uh, there now. Pavel Kolosh is the uh, one of the founders of DNS, which is w where Yonda came from and Carol Lewitt came from after that. Um, so DNS, they have courses, they have all sorts of courses. Um, after DNS, which is a uh, developmental kinesiology, so like they say that babies. Uh, have a very predictable set of progressions of like lifting their head and then rolling and coming up on all fours, uh, rolling on their side, mm -hmm. pulling themselves up. And then they would re basically visit rehab in that sense. So if you have back pain, we're going to start you at a one month position. Now we're going to get to a three and a half month position. Hmm. Um, we could go into all of this stuff, but after that, so latch on to what you want to latch on to, but after that, I got into, and it's a little less popular these days, but there's still definitely some crossover. This guy, Leon Chaitao, he has a lot of manual therapies. Chaitao, uh, C-H-A-I-T-O-W, he's passed, uh, but he's also one of those forefathers in our industry. Like, you, If you call yourself, if you're a practicing clinician, you should know who these people are. Um, I've read all of his books. It, they're great. Um, after Chaitao, well, there's a bunch of older guys I went into. Um, some physiotherapy guys in Europe, they practice medicine, physical manual medicine, a little bit different than we do. Um, but then I got into some stuff here in the States called PRI, and PRI puts a bunch of things together when I was talking about the natural asymmetries in the body. Mm -hmm. They have a way of laying that stuff out, Postural Restoration Institute. People make fun of them because there's... Um, Balloons. Balloons blowing up and they mm -hmm. really, they break down. We've talked about patterns in the body. Mm -hmm. They lay out a main pattern uh, and then there are sub patterns beneath that. And so if you want to get really granular, they connect the orthopedic tests to the patterns. And so you can do a set of orthopedic tests and be like, you are this type of pattern, you are this type of pattern. And you need to, for me to learn, I have to like bathe in this stuff. Like I have to listen to these lectures over and over. I need to, like the K-Star thing, like Kelly Starrett, I need to know your mindset. I want to think like you think. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's, that's everybody. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of other people. The, the main recommendation that I give younger doctors is that if you find a school that says to do things this way, and then you find another school that says, this school sucks, don't ever do it like that, mm. you got to study both of them. Yeah. You got to be, you got to know both. Um, that's a long reading list for you, those young chiropractors. That'll keep you busy for a minute, but yeah. No, that's good. Just to add something kind of a little bit different, I would say for these new docs or new clinicians, chiros, even trainers, is think of it a little bit like the food pyramid. You want to start, you know, not the, not that food pyramid sucks. Right? Yeah. What is it, like 30 servings of grains up, every day? A pyramid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a, pyramid. Higher, yeah. a hierarchy. If you think of it like that, like there's strata yeah. of this, peri uh, this pyramid. And on the, you don't want to start with Postural, Postural Restoration no, Institute, even don't. though they might have had the biggest influence on me per personally. Yeah. You want to start with Gray Cook. You want to start with K-Star, Kelly Starrett. You want to start with, yeah, books like Movement and things like Stuart McGill. Like, oh, yeah. I mentioned this earlier. Like, I was just mad that every Cairo student doesn't automatically mm -hmm. know every word of Stuart McGill. It's not like yeah. you see Stuart McGill... Like if you read him, you're some special nerd that went way above and beyond. This should just be automatically regurgitated from every chiro person, yeah. but but it's not. You'd be lucky if they can. They might tell you that oh, the <clears throat> bird dog. That's 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 him, right? Like that might be what they know. So I mean, I think you build the foundation with with these things like find the trigger. How do you you know regress and lateralize a person? How do you coach a person? Mm -hmm. These are really beneficial things in the beginning. Mm -hmm. How do you take somebody who can't do a deep ATG split squat and how do you get them? How do you progress them? How do you regress them? Or as uh, Weingroff says, how do you lateralize them sometimes to, to uh, an alternative movement to, to accomplish the same task? Mm. And then as you get more and more experience and you get towards the top, then you check out things like DNS and PRI, and it'll 
it'll honestly, it'll resonate a lot more. Mm-hmm. Cause I can tell you something I've talked with him a lot about is like, you know, after I take a course, I'm worse as a clinician yeah. for like the next month <laughs> because you're trying to implement a bunch of stuff you really don't truly understand. Or you, you think you got it because you understood, <laughs> you know, it's like when you're in math class and they show the problem on the board and you're like, I follow, I follow. And then you get to the test and they've changed it slightly. Well, now with the cannon is being shot out of, you know, <laughs> off the second story, you're like, I don't know how to solve this problem, <laughs> you know? And that's, that's the clinic. Yeah. That's the clinic. So, I mean, I think you start, you start, start with foundations and then you get more granular and you get to the more esoteric or even woo-woo stuff. I mean, uh, get to that later. Yeah. What was really cool is in the very short time that you guys were working on me, uh, dude, you you gave me the exact same diagnos- diagnostics or diagnosis, I should say, that Stuart McGill gave me. You awesome. know, so you said it like right on the spot. And so that was freaking awesome. But you guys are, your approach is awesome because you aren't closed off to anything, it seems like. And then what you just said right now, John, it's like, if you see two people going at it, you should study both. 100%. Where does this come from? Like, where did you, like, I don't know, did you follow somebody that was more open-minded or did you guys just find it more beneficial for yourselves? I grew up, I was, I was homeschooled. I don't want to talk too much about myself, but like I grew up and I, I had the idea that like, I, I'll see something interesting out there and I'm like, how does, how does that happen? Like, I need to know. I remember watching my dad put a, a cassette in a VHS and I was like, what sort of magic is? And I, I like, I want to know the, the underpinnings of it. I want to figure it out. And so people will say stuff and yeah, I'm just like, what do you mean by that? Let's dig into it. What do you mean by that? It's just something, yeah, a mindset. How do you do it? I think one of the things that shocks you right away is that people come in and you're supposed to help them. And yeah. when you get out of school, you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. this is scary. You're like, <laughs> they're trusting me and paying me sometimes a lot of money. You're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So you immediately feel this guilt of like, I have to get better at this. Yeah, And I think that's a, that should be something that <laughs> all clinicians feel that like they don't understand the situation. We need to learn more uh, to do that. I mean, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, I think there's also an ego aspect of it, at least initially for me out of school was like, you know, my favorite movie growing up was Goodwill Hunting. I, and I've always admi- my grandfather was extremely smart and I, like in many ways anyway. Uh, and I always admired intelligence. It's just something I admire mm-hmm. uh, in people. And so out of school, like I want to be the guy. Like I want somebody to say like, you know, like Stuart McGill's names tossed around. Like now actually that doesn't really motivate me at all. But it did initially, and it did that combined with a real uh, fear that I, or like being scared that I have to actually help this person. This person's depending upon me. I think that pushed, you know, that pushed me to explore as much yeah. as I could. And I, I wish like I only could, you know, work 10 hours a day and the other, you know, the other, or sorry, 10 hours a week and the other 30 hours I'm, I'm doing continuing ed. I, I would just love it. Mm-hmm. Or I would just see two, three people a day, and that's my focus, and I could really help them. The problem is there's not a great market for that type of setup. Yeah. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I mean, like, it's, it truly, you got, you got to be, be humble and want to learn. You see mm-hmm. stuff that you don't understand, figure out a way to understand it. As far as lifters are concerned, since there's so many lifters listening, I think I asked you guys this in the beginning, but, you know, individuals who are power lifters, and I think, mm, to an extent, Olympic lifters can be added into this, but... What type of overall like long-term movement dysfunction do you see within individuals in this community? Because as we've started getting into more movement in general, um, you know, I was lucky enough to get into grappling. So there's a lot of varied movement there. But as some of these athletes get older, you start to see how their sport may have affected their body. I think Mark, Mark is an example of this. He was an elite level powerlifter, but now doing a lot of things, he f- like... You know, you can explain it better than I can in terms of this levels of stiffness you feel in certain areas trying to get in. So how can athletes mitigate the long-term effects of lifting sports? I want, actually, I'm, I'm interested. Bobby has a really great answer for this. And mm-hmm. it goes back to the upper cross and lower cross guys, which is a very basic kind of pattern of the human body. And it can get more granular and specific. But there are a set of muscles that do one thing and a set of muscles that do another. Let's just say prime movers and fine movers. Mm -hmm. Uh, They use the words tonic and phasic. And Bobby explains it actually really, really well. So like, I don't know, take it away, Bobby. What are those 
first explain what tonic and phasic are, but like the the anterior tib stuff that like that Ben has people doing now. Like there are muscles like the anterior tib that are just not addressed. Yes. Um, there are hip flexors that are not stretched. Um, but yeah, Bobby has a great explanation for it, honestly. Well, this this comes from the DNS guys or the people from, you know, the, the people that focus on primitive patterns or infants and uh, uh, what do you say? Um, uh, developmental. Word? Developmental, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Milestones like as, as babies age and we, we see these patterns that they exhibit. They noticed people like Voita and, and Collage and all these things. They noticed Yanda, that. Lewitt. Yeah, they noticed that babies like uh, upon being birthed had certain muscles that were activated certain and we call those the tonic muscles these are the muscles like the low back the calves things like pectorals lats things like that these tended to be active in infancy mm -hmm. and so and they noticed what was inhibited upon birth were things like the longus cola in the neck or or hamstrings or core sometimes parts of the core the obliques mm -hmm. tib anterior maybe yeah you can't stretch a baby's hamstrings <laughs> that's <laughs> it's very true. true yeah their legs are like bent it was weird i remember like messing with my kids like when they were little yeah yeah so true. what they testing stuff out <laughs> yeah, of course yeah and they, they have a tiny little marble hip with a big socket so that's why they can chew on their toe all day long uh, <laughs> But anyway, what they what they uh, observed basically was that in it in adults, we would often re regress or resort to that infant stabilizing strategy that you do upon birth uh, when things are off or when weakness sets in or injury sets in. Mm -hmm. We resort to trauma, it. trauma, mm -hmm. that, and that's why they you know it's like you've never seen somebody come in and just like my hamstrings are just so strong I can't turn them off. But how can I get my quads to turn on? Like, barring some kind of surgery, like, nobody says that. They usually say the opposite, mm. right? Or, my, I just, my, my uh, what do I, what was the one I used earlier? Or, oblique. Uh, obliques, obliques, yeah, yeah. I just can't shut my obliques oblique. off, you know? Yeah. Like, so this is DNS kind of talking about that aspect so, of things. But I, one thing, like, to, on that point, the question that you asked, I think it, yeah, I think it depends on the intensity and severity of how you're doing it. Mm. If you, if, if it is your career, uh, how much mitigation is how much willingness you are to put into it outside that task, but yeah. you are going to suffer like guaranteed to do that sport. But I do, I, I think the best advice you could give is like, could you take a time machine back and just start moving in, in a lot of like, like the book we talked about range, yes. be a Roger Federer as a child and you'll probably move better later in life, but you mm -hmm. can't do that. So I think there's a definitely <clears throat> opportunity cost that you have by being a serious professional athlete. Like mm -hmm. Mark could maybe be marginally better uh, for sure if he was really cognizant of it during his, his uh, prime years of, 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 of powerlifting. But he's still gonna, he's gonna compensate. And he has to compensate to accomplish it's those important. tasks. It's important to compensate. So yeah. like the, that list of muscles though, to get back to the actual answer to your question, mm -hmm. uh, like the anterior tip, the intrinsic muscle, the, let's go up the chain. The intrinsic muscles of your feet, low hanging fruit, lacrosse ball, work lifting your toes up and down, right? Anterior tib is also going to be weak. The calves are going to be tight. The quads are typically going to be strong and too tight. The hamstrings are going to be weak. I remember hearing a Louie clip where he was like, most commonly, this, when someone, uh, what was it, a squat or a deadlift, gets to 650 and wants to get to 700, your hamstrings suck. He was just like, your hamstrings are weak. Same thing with the bench. He was like, your triceps. Triceps fall along that 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 list of things that that are weak and unattended to. Mm. Your rhomboids, um, muscles like that. Your core and obliques. And so, so a stretching things like your calf, str strengthening things like your anterior tip, stretching things like your quads, strengthening things like your hamstrings, strengthening things like your obliques, stretching things like your glutes. And so you could uh, loosening things up like your pecs, strengthening things like your rhomboids. Uh, stretching your biceps, strengthening your triceps. What about like internal rotation of your hip and Here external we, rotation of your shoulder? That that's that's the next rabbit hole. So like we were talking about fascial movement and bigger planes. So we can isolate those muscles, and they're very important as well. But then you need to know those muscles work in larger tandems, right? So in terms of external internal, you want to go over the internal external rotators. <laughs> I because I mean, I'm wondering like, yeah. as, as I'm kind of jogging some of this through my yeah. head as we're talking, you're mentioning like, oh, it's rare for someone to, you know, be like, oh my God, my glutes are way too strong or my hamstrings right. are way too strong. 
I kind of almost wonder if the same is true of like internal external rotation and maybe we can make a generalization. I know it's not a great idea all the time. No, that's good. But yeah. internal rotation of the hip, external rotation of the shoulders. Like mm-hmm. I don't what do you guys think about yeah, that? You're, you're right. There's thing it's there's actually a term for this called capsular patterns. Capsular mm-hmm. patterns tell you typically with the average person this is how they degrade over time. Mm-hmm. You're going to lose in hip the capsular pattern of the hip is internal rotation. The first thing you will lose is internal rotation. And adduction. That is that is usually what Adduction is what? Bring Com- your, coming inwards, okay. adding abduction, going away. Bringing away from the midline. I always miss, miss, mm-hmm. miss uh, that up. Yeah. yeah, same. Yeah. So, <laughs> where were we? Uh, uh, internal, external, capsular patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the cap, there's, like I said, there's a term for that. But, so when you take your sport, for example, like what the example you used, your job for most power lifters, not necessarily Olympic lifters, but power lifters, a lot of times it's that ER, that external rotation. You know, you toes slightly out, knees out over the over the ankles in mm-hmm. kind of a like a sit back, heavy hamstring, low back type of squat, powerlifting squat. That's gonna feed into the capsular pattern of losing internal rotation. You're good at external rotation. You're great at poor it. at internal yeah. abduction. Yeah. So football sorry, soccer players are typically the same way. They've just been turning their foot out, passing a ball like 10,000 times a, yeah. a year for years, and they rarely need to turn it in. So mm-hmm. you're going to see a capsular pattern for them, but way ahead of time. It's just going to be sped up. So I'm just shocked when I get a, a soccer player on the table and they, their hip turns in, to be honest. They just, they're awful at it. And then this is where patterns come in where you find people with instability. So if you notice that they have internal rotation and adduction, Andrew, Mm -hmm. then you're like, whoo, hold on. Why do you have this? This is not common. Like there's this uh, phrase, we were talking about this guy, Tom Sachs. He's an artist, but he says creativity is the enemy. You need to have some sort of structure, some sort of framework to work off of. First, we know that these are common. This is the 80%. What's the 20% so that we don't miss it? So like the external rotation, same thing with the shoulders. Internal rotation is not common. So if you have a bunch of internal rotation, I'm like, what have you done? There's some, is there a capsule that is snapped? Are there ligaments that you're missing integrity in that you've got that internal rotation? Which is where we're like, maybe we don't do mobility on this, we need more stability. Would it be fair to say that like, if you have external rotation of your shoulder, that you would have decent range of motion internally and then the opposite of the hip? What's interesting sometimes is it's the opposite. If yeah, you lack external thing. rotation, you might have a what seems to be a lot of internal rotation. But a lot of that's just based on position of the shoulder. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there's an interesting thing like where you take somebody and you put them at the edge of a table and you let their arm mm. abdu- like kind of fall like this. You might notice one arm goes way down off the table. This is like a PRI concept. You put them on the other side of the table and the le- this arm just maybe barely drops. And you say, okay, maybe <laughs> is the left side really tight or there's a problem? But what you don't realize is that the person's whole thorax and rib cage is already flying their airplane to the right, so to speak. So they're actually equal, but it looks like there's a ton of abduction on the right side and there's nothing on the left. Mm. So a lot of times the position of the hip, if it's if your static posture is in far external rotation, for example, it looks like you have a ton of internal rotation because you're starting in external. Ro- Does that make sense? Very mm-hmm. tricky. You're already sta- you're already in external rotation, so it looks like you have a ton of internal rotation where you're already if you're already at the end of your external rotation like and then you try to externally rotate it feels like nothing's there it's all based on position it's like the the hand is not sitting at 12 it's already at three and you're trying to go further to five you see what i mean that's super troopers he's pulled over i can't pull over anymore he's already (laughs) pulled over that's what he's talking about you're already there so it looks like you have more but you don't it's very tricky you haven't seen that either in sema i can tell from super troopers troopers. because you didn't laugh that that one's that's fairly let me me, i mean not new but i know it's not not that the schnozberries taste like schnozberries there's my guy Shenanigans? That's Shenanigans? a great, yeah, no, that makes a lot. So we have that template to look at external and internal rotation. So it can be tricky. This is why we're like assess. But generally, back to your question, you as weight as weightlifters is what we're talking about. You need adduction and internal rotation. We were talking about that earlier. Same thing with your shoulder. You're probably good at inter- external rotation, uh, which is where you can create a lot of torque, which is important in weightlifting, right? Mm-hmm. But the opposite is true. Like, well, you need internal rotation as well. I'm trying to think like an Olympic lifter, when they go to do something like a clean, their feet automatically kind of flop way outward. Mm -hmm. And the guys that are really fucking good, their feet are actually straighter. 
And the guys that are really good are actually kind of more naturally bow legged a little bit. Mm. And they're able to have their feet straight and land, you know, with, with kind of perfection. It just brings up a lot, a lot of interesting things. Like if you get really good at one thing, mm. uh, you could be leaving a lot of other stuff behind. Um, interestingly enough, there was enough knowledge when I started down the rabbit hole of powerlifting. There was enough people talking about um, kind of these uh, diagonal patterns and um, mm-hmm. the, the Paul Check being one of them. Oh, and and Check, I, yeah. I did mess with a lot right. of that stuff in the beginning. Uh, but as I got more like tunnel vision, I honed in and focused on the task. And I was like, I don't really know if I need because uh, most of that stuff I did when I was weaker, like most and like wood chops and things like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, if I could have rewound anything or, or worked on anything, it would be just a, even a small dose of that stuff uh, may have may have left me in better off shape. Uh, getting out of the sport, but like I'm still able to do a lot of shit, so it's hard to say. Yeah. I don't know if that would have pulled me away from, uh, you know, being able to do some of the things I did. I'm I'm not sure, but uh, looking back at it now, it seems like it would have made some sense to keep a little bit more of that stuff in there. And Louis Simmons was a huge fan of that stuff. He was like, "Yeah, you guys, you're huge. You have to sled drag. Like mm. we need some sort of we need some kind of conditioning. You got to mm. do farmers carries. You got to do." med ball tosses and stuff. He was a fan of a lot of this stuff. He just couldn't get anybody to do it. Yeah. But, yeah, but just to defend you a little bit, there's always an opportunity cost for everything. So if you get, if you got a lot more flexible, just think of like some hippie yoga person. Like, mm-hmm. do, do you think they're going to power lift a lot? Like you just, you're not going to bet on that person. And right. you know what, if for them to use energy to stabilize takes a, takes a ton of energy. Like, like, I don't know what some percentage of their effort. It might negatively ju- impact. Yeah. Them. They can't, they cannot put the force through the bar. They're worried about trying to keep their femur from wobbling, their lower leg from wobbling. Mm. So by you generating stiffness through the years, you don't have to waste effort and force and <laughs> ATP and all these things right. to stabilize. You're already stabilized. Mm-hmm. So now when you That's push true. through the floor, the bar goes up. I didn't and even need to warm up a lot of times. Yeah. You you start going. You're already yeah. stable. So yeah. You, yeah, maybe you're better off today, but maybe you squat 850, not 1,080 or whatever it was. Yeah. What are, you, what are you guys doing on your personal day to day and in terms of improving your ability to move and age well? What are some practices that you guys have? I know we talked about play, but yeah, what, what does that kind of look like for you guys? I run. Yeah? Run, man. I, I mean, I played college soccer. My body just responds well to running. Like, same thing with you and lifting. You're just like, you can lift and your body's like, absolutely. I run hills. Hills. I'll tell you one thing I've been into lately is running downhill. Um, it's just not, it's just nice. You got to learn. There's one of the, um, the movements and things that uh, eccentric movements mm-hmm. are hard. Like your, where your Nordics, your mm-hmm. hamstrings eccentrically yielding as I run downhill, you have to learn how to absorb force. And it, and so anytime I kind of find a, a problem I have, I just, I hammer that down for a couple of months. So right now I'm running a bunch. Okay. Um, but I drove, I drove from San Antonio to LA 20 hours, no back pain. Um, wow. Okay. I mean, you got to practice what you preach. I mean, I, I sit d- down in a deep squat. I think that's crucial. Um, I need to start hanging. Uh, basic stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bobby? I, I think I'm in the position of a lot of listeners maybe where I always battle what I want to do versus what I should do or need to do. Mm-hmm. I'm no different, <laughs> even though this is my field. And most of my accidents or injuries or problems or compensations or patterns or whatever adjective we want to use here are from ego-driven wants. You know, mm. like I just want to be strong. I'm kind of a big guy naturally. I mean, not, I'm not heavy right now. I used to be very heavy, but I'm, I'm a kind of a big statured guy. So I'm like, shouldn't I just be strong? I mean, I have the opportunity to be a big guy. I should, I should do that. And I, mm-hmm. and I like that. I like powerlifting type stuff. I like to lift heavy weight. I love the feeling of lifting heavy but if I'm honest with myself, the the more strength I get or from a, like a lifting heavy weights, the less athletic I feel sometimes. And I miss say that one more time. Like the let's say the more I get into something like power lifting or yes. even Olympic lifting, uh-huh. as I have done this before, like home in on this as what I do every day, like bulk, Bulgarian style, to, yeah. you know, everyday kind of training. I get stronger, and I can squat a lot, but I'm also I feel the most unathletic I've felt. I agree, and. 
And that's something I struggle with because I love that a lot more than I like to lay on the ground and do 90, 90 rotations of my hip, yeah. mm -hmm. to be honest. So, but, but there's this, there's cost, there's cost to those things. And I'm getting to the point where, you know, you have a son, you have a child and you're like, look, man, I love front squatting as heavy as I can, but <laughs> is it really worth me? Like looking like I'm 75 trying to pick my kid up. Like I'm starting to the, the, the trauma is there enough for me to say, I think I'm going to start to head towards things I need to do a little bit more. Uh, I do think strength is extremely important, though. It'll never be something I don't do. I'm, I'm always in the weight room in some capacity. Mm -hmm. But I would say now like the things I, I'm not great at would be some areas of flexibility. And also some cardiovascular has not been a big component of my life. So I try to work on a little bit more zone two stuff, cardiovascular health. I, you know, I, I try to keep the heart rate rate quite low and go for longer distances or longer rides or cycling. Um, and then, yeah, I fit in my training, but I don't want it to be so much that compensations and patterns start to kick in. Mm. You know, I can squat every now and then. And I do think maybe a tip is like unilateral work really mm. kind of helps stop patterns from kind of fall, you know, kicking in a little bit. Mm. So if you're yeah. doing some, you know, some uh, step ups, step up and over a box, Every step's a little bit different. It's you're going one, you know, right leg up, left leg back, and then it's vice versa, and you're you're constantly kind of variable. Versus, you know, what's the goal of power? You said it yourself, like lock in, do not move, right? right? And yeah. that's what you want to to squat a thousand pounds, but it has an opportunity cost of locking you into your position, and then you pay somebody like us to try to break you out of that position. So this that's a long way of saying it. I'm sorry, but I'm, I am trying to work on trying to do more things that I do need to do mm -hmm. versus what I really love to do. <laughs> but I'll, I think you can do both right over time. You can morph yeah. and you can start, you maybe you didn't like running, but as you do it, as you, you know, as you get better at stuff, yeah. all of a sudden it's something you do like to do mm -hmm. magic. Huh? Yeah. O opportunity costs. Like I was, the most efficient things when I get into the gym, I want to do, I want to make sure I have hip extension. Like we were talking about that with Andrew. So like I'll check my ATG split squat. Like, can I get there? What do I feel? Do I have hip extension? And then thoracic rotation, something we were talking about yesterday, kind of twisting back and forth. If I, ch I kind of check in on those and see how that's my barometer for how I'm feeling. If I can do those, I'm pretty good to go. But yeah, hip extension, thoracic rotation, arms up overhead. If I can kind of do some of those, then cardio is super important. Well, yeah, to give some pragmatic advice, we got a good buddy, a mutual friend who has something called the big four and a half. Oh, yeah. Right? So it's just like... If you have, what is it, he's got, if you, you need good big toe extension, can your toe come all the way up? Yeah. It's like, do you have good hip flexion mm -hmm. or hip extension? Hip extension. Thoracic rotation. D dorsiflexion was one you meant. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Dors your ability to bend your ankle, your knee over your, your toe, knees over toes, yeah. that ability. Your ability to have good toe mobility, great toe, big toe, first toe mobility. That's the half. Yeah. Yeah, that's the half, the little guy. It's important, <laughs> hip, but hip yeah. Extension, hip extension. The ability to pull your <laughs> femur or your leg behind you without compensating, without overusing your back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thoracic rotation, the ability to rotate side to side. And that's a, that's a big one that people the, do miss a lot. Like even in CrossFit boxes, right? Everything is very linear. It's very sagittal. It's forward, mm -hmm. forward and backwards. You, you lose ro rotation is mainly in sports, to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. So that's another bonus to pick up even a hobby of a sport. These are covered very well in that uh, movement, uh, Greg Cookbook movement. Uh, God, I'm going to grab it. Grab it. Nick Askey, thank you for the big four and a half. Three and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. four and it is four and a half. Four and a half, three and a half, whatever. They're great. Dorsiflexion, hip extension, thoracic rotation. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can check in on those, you're pretty good to go. Yeah, yeah. I think I got a zero on all those. <laughs> that's your FMS score. I can, I can move my toe, and then that's about it. That's, that's good. That's the start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You guys have heard of like functional patterns? Yeah, sure. Yeah, now be. No, no, that the, that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you know, when I've been watching and seeing a lot of the stuff that like he's he's showing, um, one aspect of it that I I and I, I dislike this of anything that ends up being a little bit dogmatic is like it's uh, from the messaging standpoint. Uh, I see I see some practitioners that are talking about like certain things like they talk about knees over toes guy and they say oh the people who are doing this they're going to need knee replacements in three or four years because of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, 
I dislike the dogmatic thing, but I see how awesome it is because when I watch some of the things that they're having their individuals do and some of the things he's showing, it's like, it's teaching individuals how to use the body as one full unit. Yeah. Like I, I, I know it's that. So I see, oh, if someone has been sitting around all day long at work, rather than going to a gym and putting a barbell on their back or deadlifting or doing these single plane movements, they can get on something and learn how to move their whole body as a unit from their feet to their hips to their upper body. I'm like, that is very fucking useful. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts about how individuals can see that and apply it for themselves and get some of the same benefits? Because I don't think that's the only thing an individual needs to do, but I think that there's a very big piece there that uh, when I look at certain other ways that people lift or people put things forward, it's missed. It's definitely missed the connection. People tend to go, there's a ditch on both sides of the road, right? Mm -hmm. Where... Uh, you can get into the, I don't know if you've got there yet, uh, the MoveNet and you know, like the Edo Portal guys. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah, Fantastic yeah. stuff. Like there's this movement and play, but it also becomes inaccessible to the to the normal person. They're like, what are these dudes doing in Barcelona and Capoeira? And like, <laughs> they're like, I just, I don't, I, if I'm if I'm going to 24-hour fitness and I'm listening to this on the way to Gold's, man, those people look nuts to me. Mm -hmm. The same, the, the, the naughty stuff, looks so you're like i don't know that i can i don't know how i would get there it's just it's unapproachable at, at times although useful so like but also the breaking down and only doing bicep curls forever it, the isolation can be also become like i said a ditch on both sides of the yes. road with this is where like the gray cook stuff really started to tie in the connections for me how hip extension and thoracic rotation are related mm -hmm. how dorsiflexion and the knee pain and my knee are related Dean's over toes guy as well. The question being, should they do things like functional patterns or should they begin to like connect things through their body yeah. and move in? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How that happens though, like the, uh, the communication of it in our field is not great right now. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't think people are making it accessible to people. I mean, that's one of the things that maybe it doesn't sound like it today, but like our Instagram page or the stuff like that. My goal is to help as many people as possible. And I want to, by the way, I, please don't lose your train of thought, but I want to oh. say your Instagram, your TikTok is so fucking amazing. Oh, incredible. Because it's, it's like, that's why, like when I saw it, I immediately followed you guys back yeah. is because like, you guys, like, you just put all this free stuff out that people can just do right now yeah. and see benefit and they can self-assess and then they can go see a clinician. Right. But there's so much there that people can do right now, which is why it's so valuable. Yeah. I, I try to, we try to make it accessible. We try to put it to fun pop songs and edit it well so that you'll do it. We, we make it a challenge and we try to make it, I, I want my, my aunts and my uncles and my cousins who, who who maybe you never were dark in the door of a gold gym to be like my back is weird but I don't really know what to try I don't know where to start but like yeah. hey this kind of looks that's interesting and I could do that on my couch I could do that in on the the, the ground in my bedroom and mm -hmm. and I'll just watch this reel over a couple times and then I'll do it myself yeah and maybe that's an entryway maybe that's uh, that that gets them started along that path. But I think that is one of the things, that's one of the areas that Ben, uh, Knees Over Toes guy, excels at. Yeah. He opens that door wide open for you. He's like, come on in. The water's fine. Yeah, you know it's what uh, I, the sympathetic magic you talked about. He's inviting people in, like, try this with me. 100%. You, you can do this, and here's a regression if you think that you can't. 100%. And here's my wife doing it while she's holding a baby, like yeah. making it super easy while she's pregnant. And then he's got, yeah. And then yeah. he's got uh, some other athletes with him sometimes that are doing harder versions yeah. where people can aspire to like see that and go, shit, that would be awesome to be able to do that someday. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I I listed that thing of books off, but you w when you're trying to present it to people, you need to bring. We were talking about this yesterday. There's a lot of potential out there. My job is to bring it and hand it over to you. And and the more compact those little reels, I'm pushing a lot of things in there. If, if clinicians are paying attention to what I'm sneaking in there, it's a we're doing it to the most recent Justin Bieber song or whatever. God bless. <laughs> but we're sneaking in interrotation and adduction. We're sneaking in hamstrings and adductors. Um, yeah. So you need you need to make it accessible. Clinicians, trainers, make it accessible. Like. That's that's naughty stuff is great. Mm -hmm. It's hard to approach. Like it, it's, it's I, hard I'm, to learn anything about it without 
you know, paying for it and stuff like that, yeah. which is mm-hmm. understandable. You understandable. Make your money. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, yep. yeah. And I, I don't want to, cause there are going to be some FP people listening. Like it's good stuff. It's you know great what I mean? Stuff. It, it's yeah. really good. And I don't, I don't think that people who are doing things that are valuable need to put everything out there for free for people because for sure. it makes sense. Like if, if you have something that you believe is extremely valuable, well, you're going to, um, you, well, number one, you're going to monetize it and you're going to share aspects of it and mm-hmm. people that find it valuable are going to go towards it. But it's, it's, um, you know, that's why like when I see some things, I'm like, there's a lot of really cool shit here. And mm-hmm. I want to try to understand it, but there's only a certain amount you can understand because only a certain amount is put out. Yeah. Um, so that's why I was just curious on your thoughts about it because uh, yeah. it seems like very valuable stuff. It's ultimately really valuable. I don't know what, like, yeah. And, and the way I think Naughty knows a lot of stuff. I just, I just wish that he would, serve it a little bit better on the plate maybe i'm not smart enough to to get it in that sense but i just wish yeah it was more edible or or the consumer the person who needs help they're all at different parts of the spectrum of course you know so if you need a higher level stuff you know some of the stuff we put on instagram is not like it's not going to make mark stronger you know Mm -hmm. at squatting not directly maybe indirectly because Mm -hmm. he's got a better mobility of his hip, but it's not going to increase the five, you know, fibrillar density of his tissue or something, Mm -hmm. you know? So, and, and John's really the face of our Instagram and does a lot, all the, you know, all the tough stuff for that. And he, and, and what I admire about what, you know, how he presents it is really that it's, it's low risk for general public. And it's also a lot of it is about awareness. It's like giving, it's like auto biofeedback. So when people try this, like you lay on your back and you put your feet on the wall and you shift one knee up and you pull the other knee down, right? You're like laying on your back in a deep squat, basically. And you shift one knee up towards the sky and you yes. try to pull the other leg down, like jam it into your butt or into the floor. And then you do it on the other side. This seems so ridiculously simple. But if somebody is aware, they'll notice, okay, these are both really difficult. And I th- mm-hmm. this looks like a very easy task and I'm, ha- I'm struggling right now. Mm-hmm. Or one side feels great and the other one's not. You just, boom, you have an idea immediately. Here we go. Look Some of these it. movements are versions of like a lunge and or a version of a squat just mm-hmm. with gravity taken away from it. Yeah, a lot of these things are just designed to kind of take some of the uh, variables out of the equation mm-hmm. so that it's easier for the general public. For example, if like, you know, if I'm the stretch kind of like in that position that you're in the spread eagle position yeah. with my butt up against the wall mm-hmm. and my balls facing the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To be descriptive for everybody. Sure. I can stretch pretty good like that. I can actually let my legs fall and they can go out pretty good and right. and um and I made a little bit of progress on that. I've been messing with it. I can also squat that way. Yeah. I can, you know, put my feet flat and then have my knees way, you know, quite a bit above my hips for my mobility. Exactly. It's way different than if I'm just standing there. If I'm just mm. standing there trying to do it because of gravity. It's like too much tension for me at the time, at this time, uh, for me to stretch. And then I'm distracted. So I don't know if anybody listening has had this happen, um, but like, somebody might say, hey, try this stretch or try this movement. Mm -hmm. This is going to be restorative of this area or it's going to help you stretch this area, but something will hurt. And then I'm like, I can't even stretch like what we're talking about. So some of these things where you're going up against the wall or you're using the band, as I was showing you guys in the gym, where you have this like regression, they're really amazing things because now you can concentrate on the actual movement rather than having pain be like a hindrance towards the thing that you're trying to do, which can be immensely frustrating. Yeah, I mean, you have to like almost imbibe that Stu McGill, like don't aggravate it. We need to put you in a position where you don't aggravate, where you have a chance to succeed, like set your people up to succeed. And that's what some of these, they look we- like weird positions. Mm-hmm. There's there's a block under one knee. You're laying on your side. We use the wall. We use the mm-hmm. ground to, to put you in a position to win. Yeah, we try to be as inclusive as possible yeah. in these posts. So. That's why you don't see a lot of, imp- like myself and John are probably using a lot of implements or weights or barbells or sleds and stuff, but you don't mm-hmm. see it a lot of the Insta- Instagram because it's quite exclusive in many, in at least in our following where a lot of them don't have that ability, right? So it's inclusive because we, we usually do it at your house. Maybe just you have a wall and we can get feedback about that. Like, well, I'm going to make my wall dirty and my wife will be mad at me. I'm like, come on. Most, <laughs> everybody you comments. Know, at some point. The wall's but, dirty. It's okay. And you just want these exercises to be doable. Like they'll want to do them. So you show something like, I mean, maybe you can pull this up, Andrew, but like there's a pigeon stretch. That's, it takes a little bit of effort to do a pigeon stretch. But if yeah. you show somebody a wall pigeon stretch, basically where you're laying on your back and you put your feet on the wall, cross one ankle over the other knee, 
It's, it's, Let me know if you guys see it. Just oh, on that, Google. Just oh, type sorry, in like a bad. wall pigeon. I can find that. Yeah. And uh, so basically what you're going to do is, you know, put your feet on the wall, lay on your back, cross one foot over the other knee. I see. And li you want to be so close to the wall that you actually have to lift your butt up to cross your leg over. Oh. Okay. So then you just let gravity do all the work. Mm -hmm. yeah, say, somebody, need, yeah, somebody that might have a hard time kind of crossing their legs as they're sitting would probably have a way easier time managing that because you could be further or closer to the right. wall Correct. and manage whatever mobility you got. For sure. Yeah, I mean, do you want to be basically shitting bricks the whole time while you're trying to get in, uh, you know, 30 seconds of this pigeon? Or is it really helpful to just lay in that position without a lot of effort for nine minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, 10 minutes? Because it's really no cost. Mm. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, she's pretty far away from the wall, but yes. at the closer that you get to the wall, the more your knee gets above like your hip crease, basically, we could say. And so you get to sit there just kind of there's, passively. There she's moving there up. There you go. She's moving up. And if you get close, if your butt gets close enough to the wall, you'll have to lift your butt in the air to mm -hmm. cross your leg over. Mm -hmm. So in that case, when she tries to go back down, she actually, her butt won't touch the ground. But gravity does all the work for you. Mm -hmm. So you these things that are like kind of self-limiting, these things that are that allow people to like get in these positions for a long time are it's really helpful and John talk about John and I talk about this a lot the disconnect between rehab and therapy the amount of volume we expect to create change in yeah. people mm -hmm. or our field does versus what we know takes effort to create change in people right so for example you guys know or I used to work at GNC and you, you know, the kid comes in, he's like 16 years old, he's a hard gainer, mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's like, I can't gain any weight. And you're like, what are you eating? And he's like, well, two eggs for breakfast, I have peanut butter and jelly <laughs> sandwich for lunch. Mm -hmm. And you're like, it takes so much effort. Or, or the woman who says, I don't want to get bulky. And you, you laugh because you know how hard it is to yeah. actually get bulky. Like yeah. it takes a lot of effort. Like every 17 year old boy right now is trying to get biceps yeah. and they barely emerge from all their work. <laughs> right. And it's this, so the, the disconnect is between the effort it takes to create progress in a sense of, let's say the gym, mm -hmm. and what therapy typically recommends. Mm. Like here's this white little band with two pounds of tension and you're gonna do two sets of seven, you know, two times 15 or something. You're gonna expect this massive change. I, I think it's ridiculous. Like we need to put in inputs that actually create change so if you can be in that position you can stay there for 10 minutes the research kind of supports this idea that that will have actual change structurally to the tissue versus 30 seconds of intense stretching mm -hmm. and it's the same thing if we if we talk about load or trying to strengthen the glute med for somebody mm -hmm. who has a glute med tendinopathy or an issue it's the same thing we can't just apply a 30 second low weight thing and expect massive change in the tissue yeah. and i think this is uh, you know our field is not great at this sometimes. I think we underestimate the amount of stress it, that it takes to build tissue or to change tissue. That's my main problem with back to the adjustments. Like how much of an input is a pop to your mm. back for your back pain? It, it's going to take more. It's just going to take more. Yeah, Russell, um, Russell Buddy, he's been doing the wall stuff mm -hmm. like we were just seeing. Nice. So that's been, it was pretty cool to see that and then see it here right now. Yeah, He's been already implementing that. And it Russell, makes a big oh. difference. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, if you guys don't know Russell, he's like, you know, he's someone who's a bit overweight. So a little bit of movement is restricted, but that's something that he's able to do. That's yeah. why I'm mentioning, like he's able to get into those positions. I want to ask y'all, so you guys have, you guys have been looking a little, what I would think lower than the fitness industry into our kind of physical therapy, functional movement world. You guys seem to get an idea of it. What, what do you, where do you see the gaps? Where do I see the gaps as it, far it, as physical therapy, the stretching world, the rehabilitation world? Like, like what, what, what bugs them about what, it? What bugs you about like our world? Oddly enough, mm. I, the, the funny thing is I was quite literally about to ask you the question as, as far as people in the bodybuilding and lifting community, where are they missing things as far as helping people out? Mm. But the, the, what, what gets me so I guess, interested in what you guys are doing, what individuals within the movement space or functional movement spaces, right? David Weck, FP, um, Gota. <laughs> what gets me so pumped about that is because I've like I haven't been as deep into the powerlifting side as Mark has, but I was up to 270. I was lifting some really good numbers. And even though that was the strongest I was, uh, the feeling that I had as far as an athlete, I didn't feel like I did when I played soccer in mm -hmm. college or when I was a kid. Yeah. I didn't feel athletic. Um, 
I moved like a fucking, I was stiff as hell. And that, that didn't seem like something that I wanted to grow old with. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting into BJJ and I started getting into more moving better, um, lifting less, lifting less weight overall um, and doing more athletic things. And I was like, God dang, I feel I feel like, you know, poppy. Like I feel like I can move well. And then as we've gotten deeper into this, I realized that, well, no, purely just lifting weights is not the antidote to helping people move better. Like it's, it is part of the puzzle because people yeah. need to be stronger, sure. but just going deep down that end, like you see bodybuilders and powerlifters who are older and they move like shit. Like I didn't want to be, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's like, how can we marry this aspect of becoming stronger, like literally becoming a stronger human Absolutely. being in these movements, but also being able to move well and having good functional patterns and functional movement, it's right? Yeah. So that's why, like, I that's why all of this is so important because we're thinking about how are we going to be when we're 70, 60, 70, 80. If we keep doing the same shit and just keep lifting the same weights and the same patterns, we're not going to move that well in old age. You know? I think what I saw with like CrossFit is like it ends up being like a little bit of like an equalizer, you know, like if we're mm -hmm. going to, okay, we have a bench, we have a squat, we have a deadlift, we have all some of these different movements that may be utilized in some CrossFit workouts, not maybe so much a bench, but a squat or a deadlift. Um, but then they're also rope climbing and running a mile and doing all these various things. So now because so there's so many inputs, who the hell knows who's going to be good at that? Mm. And you saw like a lot of people just at least trying it and investigating it. And what I loved about that was it put more barbells in people's hands. Maybe some more people got hurt than otherwise would have, but you're not going to, you are eventually going to run into pain and weakness being a problem for you. Uh, no matter what you do, you can't mm. completely avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's going to be dealt the card at some point in their life that you are not strong enough to get up off the couch or you're not strong enough to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. And so mm -hmm. I think there's not necessarily a problem with the people that are promoting and putting stuff forward of stretching or the people that were prom promoting things like CrossFit and stuff. I think they're, they're kind of nice in a way because they lend themselves to more people. Mm. You know, I've been talking about squats and deadlifts and stuff like that for many, many years and no one really cares. And people started to care a little bit more, and then now it's kind of fallen. <laughs> it's fallen back out of grace a little bit. But it'll make a strong comeback at some point. For sure. Um, but like with Ben Patrick and some of these other people, uh, Ben Patrick, although he's in tremendous shape, uh, he looks to have a more achievable body than some of the, guys, some of the bodybuilders, powerlifters that are performance enhanced, that are huge and jacked and lifting all these crazy weights. So... Yeah. I actually think that it's it's a healthy thing because the person that you get in the door who's excited about like, hey, look at how far I can move on this ATG split squat, yeah. which in my opinion, I'm just like, that is fucking stupid. That is lame. <laughs> 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 what it does is it brings, it, it brings someone through the door yeah, that's absolutely. in a gym. Yeah. And that person hopefully gets into like kettlebell swings and hopefully they kind of look around and they say, you know what, I'm a little skinnier than I would like. I would like to, you know, lift a little heavier, mm -hmm. be not only uh, not only feel good in these stretches that I'm already good at from just who knows why, um, but also be proficient at, at lifting heavier weights, which there, it just takes time. Like it takes, it takes a long time. So yeah. I think it's all encouragement. I think in the end, it's all uh, very positive. But in the interim, you know, we got guys with, uh, ponytails running around uh, stretching all over the place. But I think it's still a really good positive thing. <laughs> Guys with ponytails stretching all over the place. I, yeah. You're not wrong. You're not wrong at all. I totally agree. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what, how, how do, how do we make that more accessible? How does, how does our, how do we make that more accessible for people? Like, do, are you just happy that they're in the door and then just let them get rolling? Yeah, it's like yeah. church. Yeah. Like you were lying the whole time. Yeah. You know, now you want, now it's like a, now you got to start to give them the whole story. Yeah. You know, we need yeah. to lift weights. We need to, yeah. so for you guys, I think it would be a story of like teaching people about how to lift a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Like we're showing you stretching, we're showing you mobility stuff, but the other aspect of it, if you want to avoid this stuff mm -hmm. is you got to squat. You got a deadlift. Yeah. yeah. My dad was in the hospital years ago for like 60, 70 days or so. Mm -hmm. uh, almost died a bunch of different times. Um, 
And the first thing that they showed him, uh, he just had all these complications, had surgery after surgery, he was bedridden for a long time, lost a significant amount of weight, lost all of his strength. And uh, first thing they started showing him was like basically like a deadlift style of movement. Wow. He had like a walker in front of him and he would just kind of like go like this. Yeah. And I was like, you're deadlifting. I'm like, I've been telling you about this forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next day he's like doing these like knee bends and then progressively over time he's like walking and then he's doing deeper squats and then he's doing more deadlifts. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, we're all going to be faced with some situation uh, in our life where we are not healthy or not as healthy as we want to be. Right. And if you're strong going into that and or, and or you can move better and or move faster, the likelihood you'll be able to come out the other side better is probably higher or the likelihood you'll be able to delay all of that longer is probably higher. But I mean, the, the benefits are the benefits in the past, like when we lived in the bush, right, are kind of more obvious, like strength. Living in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> in multiple ways. Uh, are kind of obvious, but now, like, but even now in, in, in modern times, we still know that if you fall and you break your hip, you're like 50% likely, as an, as an elderly person, you're likely to, 50% are likely to die within a year after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Or we know that sarcopenia, which is too little muscle mass, is like the top indicator of mortality is coming soon if you have sarcopenia. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I don't mean, when I say I wanna focus less on strength training, it's just because I've focused on that Yes. But I mean, I do. I would never diminish, and it's probably uh, up there with anything else. I think, I think uh, you know, stuff like Peter Atia talks about, which is what's the best thing you can do is for almost all health factors is probably just to lose some weight if you're overweight, mm -hmm. and then after that, it's things like strength, cardiovascular fitness, and it's and it's multifactorial, right? Like so, when you say I want to move well at seventy, that's just one. A your joint mobility is one aspect of yes. health. But there's, what about community? What about your sense of fulfillment or your own well-being? Mm -hmm. When CrossFit provides a community where people are high-fiving and hugging each other and then they go out for like brunch afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's got to be huge. a massive benefit. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? That you don't get by preacher curling by yourself in the corner, mm -hmm. which I'm more prone to do, be honest, mm -hmm. to be honest. But what I need to do is probably more community stuff. You know, yeah. So sometimes it's what you're not doing is the thing you need to do. You know? yeah. I also think what's lost though too with a lot of, us to that happens is as you get really deep into strength training and doing it for years you forget the ease and how useful it can be to just do body weight work like literally going down and doing push-ups because one mm -hmm. thing is that create a lot of barriers like the barrier of having to go to the gym to start lifting some weight it's like once you start doing that you don't think that there's benefits to doing some push-ups or mm -hmm. literally doing air squats or literally doing weighted lunge like just yeah. lunges at home Absolutely. you literally if you have a kettlebell you can get I would say maybe a good, more than a half of the benefits that you'd get of the gym if you're creative enough to do it. And then, and like that's anybody in the general population, including myself, I still do push ups every freaking day because I know how useful they are. Mm. Right. So it, it's not, uh, not creating that big barrier of having to have a gym to do strength training because if you can get better with your body weight, you're going to be 100 times better than you were if you weren't. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, this goes to the, sorry, uh, no, no. I've been talking too much. The evolutionary mismatch, you know, this idea, like, sorry to say it, but we didn't put a bar on our back and squat 1,000 pounds mm -hmm. until very recently. So this is a big mismatch, but it doesn't mean it's not extremely valuable. And I, I kind of know where your values lie because when I mentioned that story about that guy getting new knees, getting a knee replacement, you kind of looked at me like, I'm not sure that's the best advice. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of suggesting it depends on where your values lie of where yeah. you want to spend your time and what it's worth to you to do something like that. Mm -hmm. like I mentioned to Mark about Jon, John Paul, the Icelandic guy who died early. It's like, I'm pretty sure he doesn't regret, you know, if you could ask him, he wouldn't regret what he chose to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's the cost that you have to be on the top of the brain that you're willing to bear. And m I would say what most people don't are not aware of that or not willing to, you know, they, they regret it later in life. That's kind of what we don't want to do. But if mm -hmm. you know, man, your thing, the thing that you love most is, is powerlifting. I support that wholeheartedly, honestly, regardless of the health costs at mm. to some point, because who am I to say that your values are incorrect, you know? So now if you ask me if it's healthy, that's a totally that. different question. Is it healthy, you know, that you run 50 miles a day? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> but if that's what, if that's what gives your life meaning mm. by all means.
Yeah. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. We sincerely appreciate it. Please, uh, we give you guys plenty of stuff to talk about, so drop us some comments down below and uh, let us know what you guys think about today's conversation. And subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already. And uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Sema. Where are you at? Uh, and see my any on Instagram or YouTube, go to the Discord. We have over 1,100, 1100 members. That is in the description. And see my yin yang on TikTok and Twitter. Bobby John, where do people find you guys? We are Dr. John Spolsky and Bobby Riley on the anatomy of therapy.com, the anatomy of therapy on Instagram, the anatomy of therapy on TikTok. Uh, we've got a Patreon. Um, yeah. The, ana- the Patreon, the Anatomy of Therapy. Every week we do Stretch Club. We do a QA. and a mm-hmm. You join Patreon. We will help you and give you the most. Cool. We give a lot of free content out there, but yeah. And the podcast too. You guys have a podcast, yeah. right? The Anatomy of Therapy Same podcast. Name. It's called Subtitle Rebuild Yourself. Okay. Come yeah. see me at Unbreakable in LA. Yeah. And do you guys do work digitally with people or is it just in clinic? Just in clinic. Okay. He works clinic. I might do that. I just, like I said, returned to the United States. So that is an option for me. That we're considering that. Okay. Yeah. You got to find a house first, dude. You got to have, yeah. Got to get a bed. <laughs> John Paul Sigmundson, the guy that you were bringing up, he has the famous quote of, uh, there is no reason to be alive if you can't do deadlift. <laughs> yeah, tell, Preach. Tell, tell him that's Amen. unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also no longer with us, so scratch your head on that one. <laughs> but he did do a 942-pound deadlift a long time ago, back oh, before damn. deadlifts were cool. That's a lot of deadlift. Oh, sumo or conventional? <laughs> I'm sure he cheated. Yeah, whatever the case figures. is. As a lot, strength of- is never weak. This week, this is never a strength. Catch you guys later. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for having us. <laughs>